Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Barry Lynn, and I am the executive director of the Open Markets Institute in Washington. And on behalf of William Hines, the director of the New Approaches to Economic Challenges Initiative at the OECD, and Julian Karaguzian, special advisor for finance at the government of Canada, I welcome you to Shockproof, Building Resilient International Systems in the 21st Century. The COVID-19 pandemic is a terrifying reminder of our personal fragility and the fragility of our societies. Many of us have lost someone dear. Every one of us knows many whose lives have been harshly disrupted by the economic crisis. But the COVID-19 crisis is more than a collection of personal tragedies. It is also a shocking demonstration of the fragility of our most important human-made systems. Much of the crisis we face today uh, is due entirely to avoidable failures of industrial systems we rely on for basic goods and services. Rather than buffer the inevitable disruptions of a pandemic, these systems were structured in ways that made the pandemic and the economic disruptions far worse than they needed to be. One result, one result was a Hobbesian struggle among nations and peoples for basic medical items, a struggle that has resulted in gross inefficiencies, vast inequalities, unnecessary deaths, and lingering distrust and even rage against near neighbors. A second result, as we will see, a second result was, an entirely, was that an entirely predictable event took us to the edge of cascading and potentially catastrophic industrial crashes. Our main question today is, can we build truly resilient international systems able to withstand any reasonably conceivable shock? And can we do so in ways that will also promote peaceful cooperation across borders and true innovation that promotes the material and political well-being of all people? One specific set of questions today will focus on this role played by consolidation or more simply, the role of the monopolist and the mercantilist in creating this problem. Pascal Lamy, as you all know, was a leader of the last year of internationalism as director general of the WTO. I spoke to Mr. Lamy the other day and he cut straight to the core. We cannot produce everything in one factory or in one country. We should have at least four and those four must be spread around the world. We must build a different global system, Monsieur Lamy said. Exactly. And in a sense, that is the conversation we begin today. We have a lot to cover. We have three hours and we have two presentations. We have three panels and we have a wrap up session. We have a truly excellent lineup of experts on industrial systems, on competition policy, and on the engineering of international systems. This includes Congressman David Cicilline, Chair of the House Antitrust Subcommittee on Antitrust in the US Congress. Uh, we, it includes Paul Romer, the Nobel winning economist who's taken a lead in looking at the effects of economic concentration. And it includes Rana Faruhar, uh, the fantastic columnist at the Financial Times who is also author of Don't Be Evil and Makers and Takers. So we must keep things moving today. And uh, it's my pleasure now uh, to introduce Gabriela Ramos. Uh, Gabriela is the OECD Chief of Staff and she is the organization's liaison to the G20. But Gabriela is also something even more important than that. Gabriela is a true leader, able to bring together the great traditions of an incredibly important organization, the OECD, which had played such a vital role in promoting the prosperity and the peace of the world for these last many years, these many decades. And Gabriella combines that with real and strong support for the new thinking on systems. So I'm gonna pass it on the conversation to Gabriella. Thank you so much, uh, Barry. And thank you so much uh, for everybody to uh, joining us. Uh, after that presentation, Barry, I'm, I'm very shy at, at speaking. <laughs> But then I'm really, uh, it's our pleasure to host this event with the Open Markets Institute. Uh, I think that Barry and his uh, colleagues and all of you have been advancing a very uh, interesting thinking uh, on, on how this structure, the economic structures, deliver uh, uh, 
fragilities or deliver soundness in, the, in our global economy. Um, in the new approaches to economic challenges, that is the program at the OECD that is hosting this event, we have been uh, really trying to look uh, for out-of-the-box thinking to uh, get away from uh, established truths uh, in terms of how the economy operates and how uh, it delivers the services that it requires. And the COVID uh, pandemic uh, show us the shortcomings of those thinking and the shortcomings of many of the economic analysis that we have been advancing. Uh, now it was created after the financial crisis, but I have, I have to, tell to tell you that, that last year, in 2019, we held a conference called Averting Systemic Collapse, and I was really thinking that it was a little bit extreme, that name, but now it has proven uh, right. And I'm joined also by Lawrence Spoon, who is our chief economist, William Hines, who heads the NIAC, and, um, and I'm so glad that you are uh, joining us. The pandemic illustrates uh, most basic features of complex systems, which is what we are trying to advance. For example, interconnectedness brings benefits, but it also means that a shock to one system can cause ca cascading failures in others, and we're leaving that today. The health crisis in a Chinese province quickly became a global economic and social crisis. And I just was in the ministerial meeting of employment in, of the G20, and, and the impact has been just uh, unprecedented. Contrary to the ideas of traditional economics, complex systems are inherently unstable. They generate shocks themselves and they don't return to previous equilibrium. There is no equilibrium. When, when one reality is, is that, that if, if anything, anything is certain, certain is that, is that, that everything is un, the, the radical uncertainty of, of the things we are dealing with and that we need to recognize. The systems are not only complex, they are adaptive. They are constantly reorganizing themselves in reaction to what their own components and other systems are doing, the famous feedback loops. Natural ecosystems, for example, react to changes in land use, bringing wild animals and their viruses into closer contact with the humans and therefore with their habitats. And we know that. So all these systems are being uh, together. NIAC, as I said, champions more accurate ways of analyzing complex adaptive systems. We are now in the midst of this systemic of Hebel foreshadowed by this uh, conference that we launched uh, the year before, uh, but that is also bringing together the thinking of many institutes, including Barry and including the universities that are joining us today, uh, the, the policymakers that are joining us today, to really look at different ways of handling these uh, harmful effects. Simply warning about in, impending catastrophes is not enough. We have to propose approaches to dealing with them. This means first admitting that important systems might fail and preparing to deal with the future. Here, another system characteristic is central. Resilience. The ability of a system to plan and prepare for, absorb and withstand and recover from and adapt to adverse events and disruptions. We all talk about resilience, but we have not been able to build that resilience in the systems that now are collapsing in front of our eyes. Nobody would argue against resilience, of course, but one lesson we have learned in NIAC is less welcome. There is a trade-off between resilience and efficiency, and I think efficiency has been the predominant objective in many of our policy choices. Cutting the number of hospital beds and staff might make a health system more efficient and lean, but at the price of less resilience. The slack is not a welcome concept in traditional economic analysis, but we might need it to confront it uh, with this uh, very impressive uh, job that we are living today. Linked to the efficiency is optimization. In AEG, we call on a range of disciplines, not just economics. Engineers and physicists tell us what, that when you are trying to optimize a complex system, you might end up destabilizing it. For the economic system, Barry has illustrated how the concentration of power in a small number of global corporations may have improved efficiency in specific domains and circumstances, but over-reliance on a few actors has undermined the resilience of the economic system as a whole. And this is exactly what we want to discuss today. Concentration of wealth and power is a fact of today's economy with 80% of the corporate value housed in 10 corporations. And this has a wide systemic impact. 
Paul Krugman and Larry Summers link growing monopoly power to weak growth, while Jason Furman and Peter Orsak argue that monopoly has contributed to inequality. It also damages entrepreneurship. And of course, we are limiting here to the economic concepts and to the economic analysis. But if we go from system to system, the social, the economics, the politics, we are really getting into the hardcore of why we have this populist expression all around our countries in terms of people not finding their way and just uh, uh, getting very uh, extreme outcomes in the political processes. Today, we are discussing what happened to production networks, why it happened, and what could be done in the future to create shock-proof systems. The answer is not localization or anti-globalization, even though we are perceiving that that's a trend now, but at least part of the answer must be anti-monopolization. And for many institutions, including the OECD, which has traditionally emphasized the need for efficiency, it's not easy to accept that we should beat slack, buffers, and spare capacities into our systems, especially when countries face fiscal constraint after the current uh, crisis. But as we now see, this is a literally a question of life or death, and therefore we need to have open mind, we need to look at what works and what doesn't, and don't stick to whatever we think was uh, the best uh, uh, analytical frameworks, but to move forward and get better answers for the people that are looking uh, for it uh, nowadays. So we welcome this seminar, we welcome uh, partnering with, with Barry and, and, and the Open Market Institute, and I think that we will be contributing to the rethinking of these systems and ensure that they are sustainable and deliver for people, and it could not have been more timely. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, yeah, so we're terrifically uh, happy to have with us today uh, Paul Romer, who is a um, uh, someone I've gotten to know over the last couple of years, and uh, the um, Paul is a, uh, uh, as you know, is uh, uh, one of the more brilliant economists in the world. Uh, he's also someone who has taken in a real understanding of the role that. Uh, uh, concentration has played in disrupting uh, uh, our uh, society and our, our complex system. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul now. Thank you, Barry. Um, it, um, it's great. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a, obviously an extraordinarily timely uh, discussion in the midst of this catastrophic failure that we're we're got, we're, we're experiencing right now. When you think about the underlying problems uh, that lead to these systemic failures, one source that economists emphasize that is indeed important is opportunism. People will take advantage of opportunities to do something that's privately beneficial but harmful to society. We need a collective capacity for fencing that in and keeping people from being too opportunistic in ways that are harmful for everyone else. A way to think about how this leads to brittleness and fragility is to think of financial sectors where uh, people cynically would joke about selling options that pay off when the world collapses. You collect a stream of income uh, in, in normal times, Purchasers think they're buying insurance for some terrible event, but then the terrible event happens and you don't have to pay off uh, because you're in the midst of a, of a crisis. The acronym that people on Wall Street used to refer to this was um, IBGYBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone, don't worry about it. It'll be somebody else's problem. So we do need to have policies that anticipate opportunism and fence it in. But there's another problem that we need to keep in mind. It's the kind of problem that the behavioral economists would emphasize. And this is just inexperience. Uh, many people who have not had experience with something underestimate the potential for it to happen. It's the, the problem I've spent most of my career focusing on is that if people aren't familiar with some good possibility, they often have trouble believing that it's possible. And so they, they refuse to try and they deny the possibility of genuine improvements that are feasible. There's a downside version of this as well, which is that people can get complacent 
and failed to take seriously the possibility that things as they exist now could collapse if some shock hits the system. So we need some way to keep exposing people, keep giving them experience with both the good possibilities and these risky uh, negative ones. Um, evidence that this matters shows up, for example, when you look at states which suffered from the savings and loan crisis in the the 19 uh, the that started in 1980s and ran into the 1990s. Those states with the worst experience with the savings and loan crisis had less disruption during the housing crisis of 2008-9 because the regulatory systems, the behavior of all the decision makers had been primed by this intense experience with the problem in the recent past. Right now, we see that nations in Asia that had to deal with SARS before have been better at responding to the current pandemic because they had recent experience with it. So the, the public policy analog that we should think about is uh, something we can borrow from, from Netflix. Netflix created what they called their chaos monkey, which was basically software that would go in and artificially break links and break systems that were running. They would go in and say, okay, this server's broken, this router doesn't work anymore. Um, and it would literally break their system so that they could find out, were the backups effective? Could they actually keep going if a server failed, if a disk failed, if a, if a router failed? So this constant experience with failure forced them to have systems that truly were uh, robust. And we should think about as, a, as public policy measures, how to force that kind of discipline on critical suppliers, critical parts of, of our economy. Now, one thing we know will be essential for this is choice. If our public policy is that we offer some rewards to some system, like a, a pharmace pharmaceutical producer, we offer some reward for participating, but uh, as a part of that, they have to show that they can keep operating if, for example, the government says, okay, you can no longer buy from this supplier for the next month or two. Um, you can't use that supplier, but show me that you can keep running. In exchange, we could offer certain kinds of insurance as we do offer to, to, to these firms. But for this to work, that firm has to have a choice. If there's a single monopoly supplier of a particular input into the pharmaceutical manufacturing process, it's pointless to have the government try and go through a drill where they force the pharmaceutical firm to show that it, they can switch to another supplier. N no other supplier will exist. If we were running the chaos monkey, it would create some demand for other suppliers so people could prove they can use other suppliers. But we have to think about other policies like antitrust policy that make sure that single firms don't take over entire functions in our society. And we've got to be clever about how those policies work. I was part of the Department of Justice case against Microsoft. I saw how that worked. I'm very uh, skeptical that antitrust enforcement through our judicial system in the United States will lead to any kind of structural remedies like uh, the breakup of, of firms, even in cases like the Microsoft case where there was a clear finding of legal liability. So we need to be creative about other ways to encourage choice. One that I've been suggesting is to use taxes. We could just say that when a firm gets big enough, we're going to tax it more heavily, a kind of a progressive revenue tax or employment tax or scale tax on firms so that there's an economic incentive for that one big firm to split itself into different parts, to spin out different units, to minimize it, its tax bill. Um, the other measure that um, I think we should be thinking about more aggressively is a public option. If there are firms that provide critical services, critical communication services, then we should have government backup systems that people can turn to if the private uh, system fails. So think about Facebook as a communication system. 
Think about Gmail as a critical node in our communication system. The government should think about not necessarily supplanting them as suppliers of services, but at least of offering an alternative that people could switch to if they're unhappy with what they're getting from those market uh, sources. And if something goes wrong and those uh, dominant suppliers can't continue to do their job, there at least we will be a structure we can scale up that can that can start to take over. So I think these public options as backups, uh, as part of our system of resilience, need to be an intrinsic part of our thinking about creating the kind of choice that you need for a competitive market to work the way it's supposed to work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. And I think that uh, your your comment uh, make way for a, a fantastic entry for our next speaker, who I'm very pleased to welcome, Congressman uh, David uh, Cicilini. Um, Congressman Cicilini serves as Rhode Island First Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. And he has a long-standing career in different positions in Congress, advancing very important initiatives to improve the well-being of American people. He is one of the House's most active members with tremendous experience on very wide range of topics from foreign affairs to healthcare and climate uh, change. But he's also a champion for equality and has promoted the improvement of minimum wages, access to healthcare, again, very topical, uh, defending LGBT rights uh, and taking decisions to ensure that middle classes have a chance, for example, to buy their houses, to send their children to uh, schools, in quality schools, and to be protected uh, in retirement. Uh, Mr. Congressman, we applaud your activities. At the OECD, we have an inclusive road initiative that cut across all areas of work uh, to ensure that the bottom share of the income distribution in our societies is not left behind. And we now know that they will be the hardest hit from the COVID crisis. And today we will benefit from your experience and insights as chairman of the House and Antitrust Subcommittee, where you oversee a very broad portfolio. I will not describe it because I'd rather have you, uh, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with this uh, group. Good morning and thank you, Gabriel, for that nice introduction. It's uh, a pleasure to join all of you today for this discussion on strengthening our international systems in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I want to start by thanking Barry Lim for his leadership at the Open Markets Institute and for holding today's briefing. I'd also like to thank Professor Paul Romer, a Nobel laureate and a pioneer in the field of economics uh, for making today's event possible and for raising the alarm about the economic dangers posed by monopolies throughout his career. And lastly, I want to acknowledge our colleagues at the OECD, and in particular, their new approaches to economic challenges initiative, which has also been active on these issues. I'm sorry I'm not able to participate on any of the excellent panel discussions today. As you can see, I'm back in Washington to vote on legislation to increase emergency funding for our nation's small businesses and hospitals that are on the front lines of this pandemic. It goes without saying that I wish we were doing more to help Americans get back on their feet Locally owned businesses are the economic engine of our country, and it's essential that to, to the success of our communities that they survive this crisis. And that's why we've been pressing hard to make sure that we support our communities and move as quickly as we can to defeat this virus through rapid testing and other measures that will allow businesses to reopen safely. Additionally, as Congress continues to respond to this crisis, it's imperative that we also address some of the issues that have hamstrung our response to the pandemic. This crisis has laid bare the necessity of producing goods in this country that are critical to the health and safety of Americans. People on the front lines of combating this deadly virus, our heroes, do not have the materials they need to do their jobs safely. We have to fix this problem. This starts by acting swiftly to secure and diversify our supply chains for essential products, ensuring that America is no longer dependent on a single nation for any critical good and strengthening our investment in domestic manufacturing. We need to move things home, especially items that are critical to our healthcare system, like the production of personal protective equipment. Good paying manufacturing jobs are also essential to rebuilding our middle class and reclaiming our identity as a leading center of manufacturing and innovation. 
We also need to improve international coordination, even while we do more to make it in America. Competition policy also has a role to play in promoting our economic recovery. As millions of businesses struggle to stay afloat, private equity firms and dominant corporations are positioned to swoop in for a buying spree. According to industry reports, private equity firms have been sitting on two and a half trillion dollars of investor cash, while dominant technology firms have over $570 billion in cash and investments. Top industry consultants are also already advising their corporate clients that the current landscape of distressed assets presents, and I quote, unique opportunities to invest, end quote. And although merger activity has temporarily slowed, industry analysts are already beginning to forecast an acceleration of deal making that may hasten economic concentration across the board. And that is why, along with several of my colleagues, I am pushing for a moratorium on merger activity as part of the upcoming stimulus package that is CARES II. Mega mergers and corporate takeovers that were permitted during the last economic crisis led to the firing of millions of workers, the slowing of investment and innovation, and huge increases in executive compensation. As we respond to the current crisis with millions of Americans facing unemployment and millions of businesses in severe economic distress, we cannot afford to repeat this mistake. If we do not act boldly and urgently to respond to this problem, consolidation may further weaken our economy by concentrating wealth and control at the expense of workers and independent business across the country. And this will have lasting consequences. And that's why I strongly believe that we must take immediate action to halt this trend by including a moratorium in the upcoming stimulus package on all transactions that do not involve firms that are truly failing or in bankruptcy. This is not complicated. Our country can leave room for merger activity that is necessary to ensuring that distressed firms have a fresh start through the bankruptcy process or through necessary divestitures, while also ensuring that we do not undergo another period of rampant and unhealthy consolidation. Our country has already had a moratorium on union formation in the wake of this pandemic. It is unthinkable that we would allow mega mergers and private equity takeovers during this crisis. Moreover, our nation's antitrust enforcers should be focusing and maximizing their resources to improve and protect American lives. They should be doing everything possible to police conduct that harms competition and consumers, such as price gouging, hoarding, collusion to suppress wages, and other anti-competitive and anti-consumer conduct. The last thing our country needs right now is expending valuable resources in response to a wave of mega mergers during a time of crisis. Uh, targeting non-compete clauses should also be a top priority. Tens of millions of Americans have already been laid off, and we cannot allow these oppressive contractual terms to keep people from finding another job. Addressing this problem will be critical to helping Americans during the recovery. And so again, I thank you for including me in today's discussion. I apologize uh, in advance for not being able to participate more fully in today's event, and I look forward very much to hearing from each of the panelists on these important topics. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks to you, Congressman. Very clear messages. And, and we wish you well in your work going forward. Uh, we thank need you. this kind of legislations. And we need to make room for the innovation and the entrepreneurship to flourish and not be uh, cut by, by this uh, high concentration. Now I may turn the floor to Rana. Rana, you are going to be moderating the panel from now on. Uh, so the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Just give a wave if you can't for any reason. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Rana Faruhar. I'm the associate editor and global business columnist at Financial Times. Um, I've been following global supply chains for really my entire 30 years as a journalist. Um, my first book, Makers and Takers, got into a lot of the um, trade-offs between efficiency and resiliency that have been a part of business for some time now. So very excited to do this panel. Um, I'll just make a couple of observations and then I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. And we've got, um, let's see, we've got about 45 minutes for our panel. And I also just wanna remind listeners that they can actually take part and submit questions, um, sending them to info at Open Markets Institute or using Twitter, hashtag resilient systems, and those will appear for me later on a screen and we can call them out. Um, so just a couple of things, even before COVID, 
Um, the problem of efficiency versus resilience has been with us. You know, I think back to a tragedy like the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh, for example, which was the result of complex supply chains, looked great on paper in a headquarters that a CFO was looking at, um, but there was a lot of risk in that system that came at a huge human cost. Um, I've also been amazed in the last few weeks at how quickly systems can become more resilient if there's good leadership. I mean, I look at um, all kinds of interesting solutions coming from the business community in the US and elsewhere, people retooling supply chains within a matter of 48 hours when the proper leadership is in place. So I think that there's a lot of challenge, but there's a lot of opportunity here. So let me um, move forward and quickly introduce our panel and I'm gonna give them an opportunity to speak for a few minutes and then we're gonna have a discussion between ourselves. Um, great panel here, we've got Michael Ulsterholm, who's the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota and author of The Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. We also have Yossi Sheffi, the director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics and the author of The Power of Resilience. Sharon Barrow, who is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Conference and a great buddy of mine. Um, Christopher Gopal, the former VP of Worldwide Operations at Dell Computer and a member of the Defense Business Board and author of Supercharging Supply Chains. So you guys are um, the all-star team of resiliency. Um, Michael, I think I'm going to start with you because as part of my prep for this event, I was reading your incredibly prescient um, piece, 2005 piece in foreign affairs called Preparing for the Next Pandemic. And I just want to read a few lines here. It says, given the extent to which modern commerce relies on the precise and readily available international tra trade of goods and services, a shutdown of the global economic system would dramatically harm the world's abil ability to meet surging demand for essential commodities such as foods and medicines during a crisis. All right, so you were sounding the alarm on this over a decade ago. What happened? Why are we in the situation we, we are in right now? Yossi, I'm gonna call on you because I know that you're the most tech savvy person among us. <laughs> and being, being from MIT, you're gonna pick up. Um, I know you have some slides that you'd like to show which could set the stage on why our production systems failed, why we're at this moment. So maybe do you wanna run those and then we'll come back to Michael? Oops, we can't hear you. So if you could just unmute. I was just testing you to see if you know what to tell me. Uh, <laughs> Good. I, I, I'll put it in the middle of my presentation because what I want to talk about, um, I, I wrote several books and wrote a lot of uh, uh, papers on supply chain resilience. So I'm now, you know, talking to a lot of media and the, there are certain um, questions that show a misunderstanding of what's going on. So let me just touch on one issue. So first of all, the difference between just in time and concentration. These are not the same thing. Uh, many pundits complain that modern supply chain management have failed. These systems are based on tight connection between manufacturers, customers, and suppliers, just in time supply and manufacturing, and very little safety stock. It is mainly the lack of such inventory that is lamented, saying that corporations choose quote unquote greed and efficiency over the welfare of their customers. This is nonsense. Uh, by the way, that's a term, the uh, technical term used at MIT. So <laughs> it's, uh, uh, the Toyota manufacturing system, which was basically adopted by all manufacturers around the world, does not only reduce costs, it resulted in huge gain in product quality, in the ability to respond quickly to market changes, in reduction in waste, in ease of repairs, and of course, low cost. So let's distinguish between it. I believe that JIT and the you know, connected system should and will continue to be, uh, uh, to be norm uh, in manufacturing. But let's distinguish between this and um, concentration. And for this, let me share with you um, A slide. Now, 
Can you see this? Yeah, we can. Okay. So this is uh, what's called a bill of material. You see on the top, OEM, original equipment manufacturer. This is the brand company. Uh, let's say in automotive, it would be Ford, GM, Toyota. Then you see tier one supplier, tier two supplier, tier three supplier, all the suppliers under them. And the problem is if we look at an OEM, the OEM may know who the tier one suppliers are because they pay them. So they know who they are. They have a vague idea of who the tier two suppliers are because tier one doesn't tell them who the tier two suppliers are for a variety of reasons. And they really have no clue deeper in the supply chain. And just let me tell you that some supply chains are 10 and 12 tiers down. Um, so the first problem in supply chain is opaqueness. You don't know who is down there that can hurt you. Mm. The second problem, if you look at, sometimes the whole industry is, is vulnerable. Companies are very good at making sure that they themselves are not vulnerable. In general, I'm not talking now about medical supply. We can talk about it later. But uh, companies are making sure that they are not vulnerable, but sometimes, Instead of this type of, uh, of structure, unbeknown to all the OEMs that are depending on one supplier, we call it a diamond structure instead of the tree structure that uh, we showed before. Just to give you an example, a company called Coppa, Italian company, it's uh, uh, in Northern Italy, they make swabs, which we are so, so much needed today they have 50% of the, of the US market. And of course, they're in Northern Italy. They were closed for a, a, a significant amount of time. So anyway, let me stop the sharing and we can talk a lot more about this and a lot of other issues that, uh, uh, that we raised before, but let me yield the floor and go on. We can come back to many of these. Let me actually, I, I want to, before we move on, because we have a little bit of time, I want to ask you one follow-up question. If you can kind of go a bit deeper on the difference and the, the importance of connecting systems and yet not having concentration, I think that that's a really important point. I mean, there is a debate out there right now, which a couple of other people have flagged, but it's all or nothing. You either have, you know, complete globalization as we've known it since the 1990s, or we're somehow going to this Hobbesian, you know, all against all world in which it's going to be national competition. Can you sketch out what you see as the balance between resiliency and efficiency, keeping what's best of globalization, but also allowing for less concentration? And I will talk now not about medical supplies, which is really a special case, and we can talk about it separately, how medical supplies should be. Uh, uh, should be handled. But let me just make, make a point about resilience of supply chain. In the United States, food is coming to stores. Uh, you may not find your uh, you know, specific cereal or specific this or that, but there's no question that food is coming to supermarkets and food is, uh, uh, is coming to people. In the face of unbelievable change to the, uh, to the demand, to the structure of demand, to the location of demand, supply chain are responding. It's actually amazing. And by the way, let me just make a point about the media, since I'm talking to you. We see a lot of pictures, we see a lot of pictures of empty supermarket shelves. It's a nonsense. They're taken at the end of the day. You come in the morning and the same supermarket shelves are full. But of course, it makes much better copy to have all these empty uh, empty shelves. In today with today's with today's um, you know information technology. It is not a question of keeping in touch with many suppliers. I, I'm working with companies like uh, Flex, uh, um, used to be called uh, uh, Electronic. They have 18,000 first year suppliers, an untold number of second and third and fourth year suppliers. They know about all of them. You realize that Starbucks have 122,000 growers of coffee. On each one of them, they know the name, the family, what uh, what they put into the ground with today information technology. It's not a question of keeping in touch with, you know, multiple suppliers, multiple customers. Concentration is something else. Concentration sometimes hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, let me tell you that uh, just a comment about this because Paul, Paul who I admire, <laughs> uh, mentioned something. 
many companies, not only Netflix, are doing exactly the same thing. Intel goes into every quarter, they'll go into a plant and tell the plant, every quarter, to any, any one of the plant and tell the plant manager, you know, this and that supplier are out of business. What do you do? And 20% of the bonus depends on how well they respond. Mm. So there are companies who are serious about it. It's easier for Netflix in some sense because it's not physical. But even companies that deal with physical products say, how do you get contract for, uh, uh, for new transportation? How do you find a, 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 a new supplier? How quickly you can do quality checks? How quickly uh, uh, you can do engineering? All of these things, people are measured on this. So there are companies who are actually very good at this and take it seriously. I, I don't want to uh, um, mm. uh, take too much time. We can come later to yeah. medical supply, which are a special case. Okay, we'll come back to you. Um, one housekeeping thing, I also want to just let everyone know that external participants can also send questions to um, NAEC at OECD.org, and we will be able to see those and answer them as well. Um, I see Christopher and Sharon on, so I'm going to come to you all next. Christopher, let me let me come to you. Um, I'm fascinated. You've, you've basically organized the worldwide supply chains of Dell, which are kind of world famous. I'm sure there must be a Harvard Business School case study on you guys. Um, you know all about uh, engineering efficiency. Um, you also know about the pressures that global corporations are under in terms of how they run their supply chains, the balance between cost, efficiency, uh, labor standards, trade. Talk to us a little bit about where we've come where the vulnerabilities are in the system and where you think we're going. And if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. I talk better when mute, but um, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'll be talking from the view of somebody who's been in the trenches, have been in supply chain management uh, all my life. Uh, in different industries. And um, it was evident to us in the field 10, 15, 20 years ago that we were focusing on efficiency sans risk. And that essentially we we're constructing an extremely good supply chain system, extremely efficient, extremely effective, and built to break. Um, Dr. Chevy pointed out the differences with uh, just in time and uh, concentration. That's all correct. The issue really is the concentration of the end supplier. No effective supply chain can function if supply is cut off. And our executives, who are all extremely good, look at the world through the point of view of shareholder value, cost, liquidity. These are critical. Liquidity is the amount of payables and inventory in the supply chain. Cost is the lowest cost per unit, or total cost, where they can source it from. And shareholder value really hinges a lot of it on free cash flow and the return on net assets, which is why an excellent supply chain often is a hollow supply chain. Mm. And if the supplier breaks for any reason, a COVID pandemic, national aggression, government policy, a tsunami, the supply chain is at risk. And I think that's the, the, um, the trade-off that we have to come and see in terms of financial engineering of the balance sheet versus engineering of the supply chain for maximum national and consumer effectiveness. I recall reading this in somebody's book, it's probably yours, Vaina, about makers and takers. And I think that's so appropriate in this regard. So let me ask you a follow-up question just on that point. I mean, um, we're dealing with very complex systems and a complex set of variables. I mean, just within the incentive structures of the financial system, we're, we're talking about 
um, you know, 20 to 40 years of small tweaks in various areas from tax to corporate governance to um, any number of other uh, areas that touch the supply chain that make it very difficult for a publicly trade, traded company to make different decisions. Do you see, is this a tipping point moment? I mean, do you see um, the system changing? I know different companies are individually taking stock of resiliency versus efficiency, but how do we recraft the system to incentivize that? Do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I think someone earlier talked about opportunism, a great term which I've not come across, it's an economist term. And, um, individual executives and individual companies will always do what's best for the company than for themselves. Today, companies don't compete, supply chains compete. And more than that, industries compete. And I think unless executives are given guidelines and in certain industries mandates about risk distributed operations, multiple sources, recovery, we're not going to get it. And I do feel we're at a tipping point. I just read somewhere, for instance, that nearly 97% of our antibiotics come from China. Mm. Uh, it's, that's ridiculous. We've found Chinese components that actually don't work too well in some of our defense equipment. Uh, the previous administrations gave a waiver for some of that. Uh, these are, some of these statistics are terrifying. And so I think we are at a tipping point. I think we've got the people in power who recognize and look at it from a national security perspective. So I do have some optimism. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I see Michael is, is on now, but Sharon, you've been waiting. So I'm going to ask Sharon to come in and weigh in. Sharon, you have been in the trenches um, leading labor globally for decades now. You've seen where all the bodies are buried. You've seen some of the human costs of the way business has been done for the last 30 or 40 years. How do you, I mean, maybe you can just give your broad perspective. Why are we at the point we're at? What is changing? Where do you see the energy in this conversation going? Okay, you can unmute yourself and then we'll be able to hear you. Okay, you so great to see you, Rana, even if in captivity. And <laughs> Rana is my favorite American journalist. I hope that doesn't insult anyone. But uh, she you have my favorite background, by the way. I love your house. Like, yeah, well, I got sick of my office. She tells <laughs> it like it is. And, uh, and I thought the last two speakers, both Yossi and Christopher, said it all really. That's why we have a failed economic model. We have a global labor market that has been simply, uh, that governments have simply failed to regulate. So speaking from a worker's point of view, the vulnerabilities that Yossi and Christopher outlined are actually only able, supply chains are only able to compete because of the labor arbitrage, because of the terrible dehumanizing exploitation of the supply chain model. And the obscurity that Yossi set out simply allows CEOs and companies to hide. There's no reason for it, even uh, before blockchain, but certainly with blockchain now, you can very easily secure contracts and so on. And other companies have done it, as you said. But the fragility of this model has been absolutely exposed when yesterday the Global layers, uh, the Global Employers Federation, IOE, the ILO and ourselves were forced to put out a statement that showed how vulnerable our multinational enterprises in the textile sector are, but it's not just the textile sector, it's simply one we focused on yesterday, when they have no cash flow, no resilience at all. And of course, you can look to share buybacks and all sorts of things, but it's a terrible model when they can't survive three months. Imagine an organisation like mine or others we didn't have reserves for three months. And so we're actually out there for the sake of workers in my case and our commitment to SMEs, despite the conditions in these countries, asking for the extension of Shore and other programs in Europe, we hope others in America, to allow them just to pay their contractual orders because many are defaulting. It's an abominable uh, picture of behavior. 
while there are terrific other employers who are guaranteeing 90 days of employment, forward orders and so on. But I tell you, it's such a vulnerable economic model based on corporate greed. Let's call it what it is. It is the 1%. It is the demand. And we've allowed it to happen. So we have to go. I'm glad Pascal Lamy is not on my panel, even though I love him dearly. But we have to go back to a more balanced model, indeed, of production. And that means in, in trade. And we need bright brains to think about because trade's part of our DNA. I'll never say trade's not in our interest. But when you look at what people, and we've already got a lack of trust in democracy, when you look at what people will demand for their own security, the optimism of jobs in a labour market that will now, not only is it 60% informal, but indeed now we'll have up to a loss of 200 million jobs. You're looking at those queues everywhere that America added another 4 million today. And also the capacity to scale up. They mightn't provide all the, the uh, technical capacity or the production capacity, but a capacity to scale up in times of urgency, what we would call resilience. So all or nothing is the wrong frame. All or nothing is absolutely the wrong frame because it will fail again, but also it's an injustice to the genuine concerns of people in all our uh, countries. Just to give you one example of how we could actually look to a combined environment of competition and, uh, and progress. Yesterday, I had a conversation with some of the health experts, and apparently we could buy the, whatever company produces it. We could buy for $10 billion the, uh, the um, vaccine that would enable it to be, uh, you know, available to everybody, $10 billion. We're spending about $10 trillion and it might be 20 before this is over. For $35 billion, we could actually provide social protection floors for the 28 poorest of country for 100 billion part payment for, for lower to middle income in a social protection global fund. Again, a drop in the ocean when you've got not only those 200 million losing their jobs, but up to 200 million now, 250 million facing starvation. It's that simple because we failed to, to regulate the labour market and put in place appropriate laws and social protections. And I would just say, because Pascal knows me well and I want to be provocative as always, but I want a genuine conversation on redefining protectionism. It's too easy. It's absolutely too easy. How do we rebalance? How do we get transparency? How do we end tax havens? All of those things. And I might add the beauty of this is talking to the Nordic uh, countries with their governments this morning, they're actually going to demand that company support comes with conditions, no tax havens, no share buybacks, uh, absolute guarantee of wages for uh, workers and so on. That's the kind of thoughtful regulation we need, not to stop global competition. Although I will say a favourite topic for Rana and I is ending the monopoly power of the big tech companies. And if you look at, I don't know, know why the other companies aren't screaming, because for an act of solidarity to give up civic freedoms and uh, commercial activities to save lives, biggest in our history, Nevertheless, big uh, physical companies have closed their doors and Amazon's making a mozza amongst others. And so, you know, with no absolutely terrible approach to workers and their rights and safety, but with no regulation at all. So are we going to have global monopolies? Is that the next big thing? And who reigns them in? Because the current trade laws can't. Only governments can do that and they're too big to do on their own. So again, part of that thoughtful conversation. What's the global future look like? So we would say to you, in, in building recovery and resilience through our um, economic models, our employment uh, models, our uh, sharing of global trade, we need to have a look at industry policy, once again, for climate and resilience as we transition every uh, sector, but also for an integrated approach that says inequality, has to be tackled, climate has to be tackled, and indeed we have to recover from COVID-19. A couple of other things like equality of uh, women and economic participation on genuine terms. But allowing now, not constraining, allowing not just cost, not just the cost curve to go down, but real resilient development in developing economies. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Well, as usual, you've covered the waterfront. I'm particularly struck by your point about the big getting bigger, and it does seem that that's already 
happening. Um, you can see it in the markets. You can see it in, in um, the cash flows of the, the largest companies. Let me ask you one follow-up question, Sharon, before we move on to Michael. Um, do you think that we can accomplish um, the, the rejiggering of the global trade system, you know, make some of the changes you're talking about within the framework of existing institutions, or do we need different institutions? I mean, how, can the WTO do this? Where, what does the new structure need to look like? Well, I'm never one to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I'm not convinced at the moment the WTO can deal in its current form and within the rigidity of its current rules with, uh, because they've been dominated by self-interest largely. I mean, I know Pascal can paint the other side and I might agree with some of it, but why have we had constrained development now for 40 years? Why have we not seen greater resilience in, in those uh, poorer economies? Why is it that then we find ourselves because of the cost down pressures caught out where we have to look to innovation? I agree with Yossi, it's actually been a remarkable to watch. But I think we need to say, well, what else? What's there, but what else? And where do we need real reform? And just even on the question of big tech alone, you cannot, you know, there is no one at the moment who can regulate on privacy, on surveillance regulation with a thoughtful approach, but it will take a whole lot of us. And therefore, I think the coming together of, you know, different voices, if you go back to the Havana Trade Agreement, this is a challenge to Pascal, really. I've been rereading the history of, because trades existed throughout our entire, you know, human history. But if you go back to the Havana principles, they were much more human-centred. If you look at the, the institutional creation of Bretton Woods and indeed the ILO and the UN itself, after the, the Great Depression, two world wars, they were human-centred. But we've allowed corporations to fight and fight and chip away and chip away out of self-interest and dominance at all of those at the fundamental floor of not just labor rights and social protection, but of humanity in many ways. Okay, I'm going to give Michael his airtime in a minute, but Sharon, we've just got one question through from an, uh, a listener for you. Your thoughts on how do we prevent Amazon from coming out the other side of this as the only one standing? Well, we have to have voices. I mean, people do not raise their voices now, which is why, despite helping the uh, the many of the M and E's in some sectors and working closely with a lot of business players, not all of them, we do do a worst company of the week uh, poll every week. But um, but nevertheless, nobody, nobody except voices of civil society and a few great journalists are actually challenging them. So where's the corporate interest that has said for generations that, uh, you know, antitrust measures, competition policy, even though I might have some reform measures I'd want to propose a part of the mix. I mean, I used to get sent to competition policy school for not reining in third party boycotts and so on. Nobody at the moment looks to rein in what is in fact already global monopoly control. Market gangsterism in lots of ways. Yeah, one other point we made, I'll just bookmark on the Amazon question for, for folks to think about. I think that this dovetails with geopolitics and with nationalism and in particular with the conflict, long-term conflict between the US and China because you know the tech companies have been trying to play both sides. Amazon has basically said, we think we're moving towards a, a, a bipolar world in which the US and China will have fundamentally different systems and technology. And so Amazon is, essentially trying to ring fence def uh, defense, public um, public procurement efforts in government. Um, so a lot of compl complexity there and a lot of um, potential for sort of politicization in new ways. Maybe we'll talk about that too on the on our next panel. But let me come now, um, I think, I hope Michael is on, um, to Michael Osterholm. Michael, if you, um, if you weren't hearing me before, praise your 2005 piece in Foreign Affairs, where you basically laid out where we are today. <laughs> and, um, and I'm just kind of amazed because you had a, here's what we should do, short-term, medium-term, and long-term kind of solution section, and um, none of it got done. So I'm curious uh, why that is. Uh, maybe you can kind of run us through 
what's happened in the in the 15 years or so since you wrote this article and um, why you think we're at the current moment. We'll start there. Michael, can you hear me? I can. Thank you very much. Diane, so you can hear me now. I'm, I gotcha. apologize for being late. There was a time mix up on the schedules here. Um, well, first of all, I wish we were back in 2005. Uh, frankly, we were much better prepared back then for dealing with what we're dealing with now than we are now. Um, in 2003, I was very involved with the SARS epidemic response uh, and can tell you that we had very few concerns at the time that despite the fact that the problem was centered in the Guangdong province of China and that that area of the world was hit hard by the SARS epidemic, we had very few international supply chains involving goods and needed services in the United States that were impacted by that uh, SARS situation. Today, you obviously see a very different picture. Um, two things have happened, I think, that make for uh, the challenge. One is where we now have our supply chains originate and how they move. And second of all, the elasticity of the supply chains, meaning that they basically aren't made for any kind of surge capacity. So uh, the first thing I just want to clarify that one of the things I think that happens with supply chains is that there's so little transparency. We don't know in many cases all that make up the different component parts to a supply chain that ultimately have an impact on that final product. If you're making a mechanical ventilator that has 1,537 parts in it that come from 27 different countries, all it takes is one country, one part to basically cause severe challenges to producing the rest of those uh, mechanical ventilators. Um, another thing, it was mentioned by Christopher in his previous uh, presentation, um, we have a lot of generalities about the uh, supply chains, but for example, we've been the group that has been investigating the issue around drug shortages. Uh, it turns out that we've had real uh, challenges here in the United States well before COVID-19 happened. And uh, uh, 18 months ago, we brought together a group of individuals, uh, experts in all areas of medicine, uh, and we identified 156 acute critical drugs, drugs you need right now or people die, what's on the crash cart, what's in the emergency room, what's in intensive care. And of those 156, all of them were generic and about 90% of them were made outside the United States in one or more pieces. Uh, and I say one or more because you know, a drug is not just simply a drug. Sometimes the incipient or, and the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient is made in one country, shipped to another country, which is then uh, shipped to a third country for final processing. And so it makes for a confusing situation. But uh, the inability to track down these systems is remarkable. Uh, our country's FDA has no really good system for that at all. The best country in the world, actually New Zealand, which we're working with very closely in this, even then there's not much transparency. And so uh, before the Wuhan crisis happened, 63 of these 156 drugs were already in some shortage status, being all generic drugs. And uh, since that time, we've been increasingly concerned. We hear numbers uh, put out all the time about how much is what. And Christopher, your number of 90% is actually what people often use. But we found that actually isn't even accurate, uh, that the Chinese-Indian contribution to antibiotics is very important. But ironically, one of the major manufacturing areas of the world for antibiotics happens to be the Lombardy region of Italy where again, active pharmaceutical ingredients are coming from China. As you may know, Lombardy was hit very hard with COVID-19 in Milan um, and made for even a greater challenge in terms of that. So um, one of the issues that we're dealing with right now on the drug shortage side is just trying to understand how to even track a supply chain to know how you can in fact anticipate shortages, what you can do about them. And uh, uh, the lack of transparency is huge. I can't tell you how many companies we deal with now around the particular COVID-19 situation where they're seeming very surprised to find out, oh my, we had no idea that in the end, the many different component parts came from that many different locations that all kind of came together. As one major automobile manufacturer said to us in discussing this, said, you know, we don't make anything, we just assemble things. Um, and I think that that's a, a one challenge. The second challenge is elasticity. Let me just give you an example. Right now we're having a terrible problem globally with getting testing done for COVID-19. And people have said test, 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 and they are typically the people who have no clue about supply chains at all, including, uh, I would even go so far as to say, Nobel Prize laureate economists who have insisted we could just do 40 million tests a week. Well, it turned out that 
the reagents or the chemicals as well as the swabs that we need to do something as simple as this PCR testing uh, before Wuhan had a pretty steady state supply chain need. And so that basically was fed by a garden hose of reagent manufacturers, et cetera. When Wuhan happened and the Chinese situation greatly amplified the need for that, that system was basically able to expand itself to almost a fire hose kind of availability. But then when the whole world caught on fire with COVID-19 and now the whole world suddenly needs these reagents, we now need a, a canal full of them, not just a garden hose. And there is no elasticity there. And people have failed to realize that our own White House continues to keep talking about testing, 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 as if somehow it can defy the laws of physics. Um, you know, basically this is about how do you scale up a supply chain for manufacturing that isn't, doesn't exist? And how do you surge yourself? This is true for all across the board, everything we need right now from personal protective equipment, mechanical ventilators, other medical supplies in general. The system was never made to absorb even a minor big bump, let alone a cataclysmic bump like we're seeing right now. So I think this has really redefined for many people what planning means. You know, when you put 35 million N95 respirators in a strategic national stockpile, and you have basically a need for likely close to 4 billion of those respirators during a period of, an out, of a pandemic like this, the shortfall is so dramatic, it's not even really worth noting that you have a supply chain uh, res reserve anywhere at all because it goes so quickly. Just to give you some perspective on that, the leading manufacturer of N95s right now, the respirators we need, 3M, uh, in the United States can produce about 35 million of these a month. Uh, in their work, their operations in China, about an equal amount that they then supply to the Asian markets. One hospital alone in the month of February in New York City used 2 million N95 respirators. Now, national production is 35 million a month, and one hospital alone used 2 million. It gives you an idea how ill prepared we are to try to deal with an increasing supply chain need that suddenly has to be there. So, as uh, Secretary Rumsfeld once said, uh, in paraphrasing him, you know, when you go to war, you don't get to go to war with what you want, you have to go with what you have. That same interview, he also, in understanding why the Humvees were not being readily and quickly fitted with appropriate armor, he said, it's not about the money, it's about physics. We just can't physically produce them fast enough, we don't have the capacity. So from my standpoint, what's happened is since 2005, is all of the elasticity, all of the reserve, all the potential for short-term gain in a supply chain has basically been lost. Hospitals don't stockpile anything. Governments don't stockpile and production can't even begin to start to deal with it. And the second thing I think that is important is when a crisis happens, where does it happen? These drugs that I just talked about, our own defense department is highly dependent on these same drugs, which they have no stockpile for they too are highly dependent on China and India for these drugs. Imagine if we outsourced our munitions production and said, oh, by the way, we're gonna to go to war with you in six months. Could you up the order for a couple of months, okay? Um, and since that's what we've more or less done right now, China owns us relative to many of these drugs and the implications would be huge. Let me just leave you with one last thought. If you understand that this is not a drug, but it's in the family of, um, uh, almost a month ago, uh, our group uh, made note that uh, with all the cases of COVID-19 we were seeing, particularly in the New York metropolitan area, that we had to be worried about being able to dialyze these patients because it turns out that many of the patients who are in intensive care or who survive that have such kidney damage, they need to be dialyzed. Well, you already have a population of individuals who need dialysis. Sure enough, uh, even though we had predicted this, had made it known publicly, you needed to plan for it, uh, 10 days ago, we started having a major crisis with dialysis in the greater uh, metropolitan area of New York City because they ran out of dialysate, the chemical material that's used inside the dialysis machine. Mm -hmm. Could have easily been anticipated, um, at least for a few weeks, moved around. Even that short-term uh, warning didn't help us with a supply chain issue, let alone the overall production. So I would leave it there and just saying, uh, right now, supply chains are the bane of my existence um, in terms of trying to prepare for or respond to a crisis like this. And what really surprises me 
is how many people who should be in the know about mm -hmm. these supply chains don't have a clue. Okay. That is, I think, to me, a really important message. Okay, I have about a hundred more questions I'd like to ask you, but let me, we've only got about five minutes left for this panel. Let me do two things. First of all, I want to just let everyone know that the OECD Secretary General, uh, Angela Guria, has just joined. So um, I want to just welcome, say a, say a welcome, and if, um, uh, if he'd like to come on the screen, maybe himself. Exactly. Or not. Um, anyway, I just want to let you all know uh, that he's here and say welcome. And then I want to I want to ask a question that's come through from Robert Kuttner, who's the co-editor of the American Prospect. I think this is a very interesting question. Given the abuses of monopoly capture of generics, shouldn't generics be made by either U.S. government or nonprofits on contract to U.S. government? Michael, do you want to grab that one? And if others have thoughts, you can weigh in. Well, first of all, we have to understand that the market forces brought to bear here uh, are such that it's not a, a lucrative business to be in generics today. Uh, in fact, we are worried that we may lose 20 to 30 percent of the production capacity for the drugs I just mentioned over the next several years. Uh, as companies are saying, you know, we have uh, opportunity costs doing this. There's other drugs we can do that are going to basically yield us a much greater uh, profit. And so. Uh, I, one of the things we have to look at is what are those strategic national products that we have to have? You know, uh, no one suggests that there's an open market where you go on eBay and buy missiles or armaments that our governments uh, through the military industrial uh, era uh, produces and buys. And uh, what we haven't really understood and defined is what are the other strategic kinds of products that we need for everyday life to protect ourselves and do we take on a whole new approach as opposed to a, a free market approach to these with a capitalist kind of a, uh, an economy? Uh, these are ones that are that critical to us that we need to look at buying in a very different way so that we can induce people to want to be in this business and make a fair profit and also offer stability. The second thing is when you're dealing with global issues like a pandemic, you have to be mindful that every place in the world is going to get hit. So it doesn't matter, but there are also challenges where if one country gets hit, if you have all of your production in that country, you have a real challenge. For example, just to follow up on Christopher's point again, where we do see a lot of the antimicrobial uh, development and manufacturing in China also all happens to be concentrated in a, a region with the highest risk of earthquakes in all of China. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've concentrated them all there. What are we, what were we thinking? Well, we weren't. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got about two minutes left. I want to bring, Yossi, I want to bring you back in. And um, since you didn't get as much airtime, do you want to respond to any of the points that have been raised? And also just very quickly in a minute or so, if you could have one policy recommendation um, in terms of how we can start creating more resiliency now, what would it be? Oh, let me count the ways. <laughs> let me um, respond to a lot of stuff. But uh, first, let me say that the, it, that the um, medical supply chain is a special case, and but the solution does not need to be uh, local manufacturing. It is very hard to keep 3M to, to 3M to build the capacity to build billions of them, billions of uh, of, uh, uh, of mass when the demand is 35 million uh, a year. This is, uh, this is bad. What we can do in, the, in this particular case and in several other um, cases when we had critical elements is to store them. We, we, we used to have a critical element, it was called oil. We had the petroleum, the strategic petroleum reserve. So we can have, you know, 4 billion masks in a strategic reserve and by the way, they should not be held in some cave in, uh, you know, uh, Omaha. They should be held by the distributors. We have a very, we have about ten big distributors of medical supplies in the United States. To get a distributor license, you need to have certain inventory, large inventory, and people will order from this, so it will be a live inventory. There are lots of other things to think about because it's not enough to have. I, I was quoting, for example, it's not enough to have masks or ventilators, you need to have technicians, you need to have people. 
I was calling in some of my writing for a medical national guard to have uh, extra people who are, you know, volunteers and come uh, uh, once in a while. Finally, let me just say the comment about Amazon. There are many, many comments, but I'll try to, <laughs> to keep it short. The comment about Amazon, my estimate is it's the other way around. We have now thousands of companies, retailers, manufacturers, who are getting good by necessity at online fulfillment. And I think Amazon will come out of it having a run for its money for, ah. for a change. There are lots of people, local, just one quick example. We have a, a, you know, a family business who used to supply restaurants in uh, Everett, north of Boston. Now they're supplying households. And you get, we never ate such fresh food in our life. Because now they, you know, every Friday you can order, you get the freshest food. The day before it was picked in the, you know, in the field and you get it, you get it to you within a day. We are never gonna go back to whole food. Never, that's it, it's changed. I mean, so there are lots of these little things happening here and there. Companies are getting better. Actually, it's competing even with Amazon. And okay, it's so, well, we'll see. I'm gonna do, um, I, I, I'm sadly, because we are on a very tight clock here, I'm gonna have to stop you, but an optimistic place to stop. That's great. And Chris, I'm sorry you didn't get a second word, but um, everybody knows your details, so you can send questions in. Let me, um, unless Barry wants to jump in, I'm going to go ahead and transfer uh, us to the next panel, um, which is on consolidation and whether or not consolidation played a role in the crisis. Um, this panel is going to be lessons from the debate on competition policy. And we have Christina Cafara. Is she on the, is she on the, yes, um, yes I see you. Okay, very good. And Rohit Chopra, is he on? Yes, I can see him. Okay, let me see if I can see him. Yeah, he's there. He's there, but he's muted. Okay, great. Um, oh, here we go. Perfect. Got you. I see you now, Commissioner Chopra. Um, so I'm going to moderate this as well. And again, just feel free to use the same system to send in questions, thoughts. Um, but let's really use this panel to dig down on the issues of competition policy, of monopoly, of the role that monopoly has played in fragility. Um, Commissioner Chopra, I think I'm gonna ask you to start and maybe you can kind of set the scene on where we've been really since the 1980s. I mean, we had a major, major shift in the US certainly in competition policy at that point. We had a shift, um, you know, uh, thank you Robert Bork to the kind of, you know, consumer oriented, as long as prices are falling, there's no problem with, with competition or monopoly that worked well in some cases, but a lot of people feel that that's now been taken to an extreme. There are um, a number of competing theories about how we should be thinking about competition policy. Some of them focus on political power versus economic power, the sort of new Brandeis theories, um, the idea that we need to go back to looking at the political lobbying power of some of these firms and the the political economy as an actual thing that we think about. There's also issues with the, the dominance of the big tech firms uh, and the fact that we're moving from an economy based on tangibles to intangibles in this world of data. And when data is the new oil, does that somehow upend the rules of competition policy in ways that we should be thinking about? So um, I'll just set the frame that way. And perhaps you can come in and tell, tell us how you think things have developed in the last few years, what role competition policy has played in the current crisis, and what should change? Sure. So, uh, Rana, thanks for that question. And I think it dovetails well with what we just heard about supply chains, that the traditional approach to examining mergers and consolidation uh, is really rests on this ideology of efficiency, that making everything much more, stretching the rubber band more and more and more without really understanding that it can snap. And so I really have been thinking hard about resilience, about what does it mean to make sure that production and output can continue? 
you know, I, I, I come from a background less about law and more about business and supply chain management, as we've heard from others, it's really about the ability to respond and recover from shocks and consolidation and mergers really put resilience at risk and, and actually can undermine an economic recovery that we're going to need to really focus on. So we heard early, earlier from Congressman Cicilline about uh, a proposal to enact a merger moratorium uh, in these moments as we rethink this. And that, that may be critical and timely because it simply cannot be business as usual for our economic policy going forward. We need to see that we have to be able to respond and recover. You know, I think about when anyone is creating a factory or building a factory or a data center, boy, are they thinking about fail safes. They are making sure that there are redundancies. They're making sure that if one thing goes wrong, the whole system doesn't collapse. And in some ways, mergers uh, are at odds with that. You know, I think about it in a few ways. It, people think trimming the fat, that's just great. But, but what about the ability and the systemic risk of completely shutting down? So one, I think a lot about buffers. You know, decades of consolidation have really uh, concentrated a lot of key sectors of the economy. Uh, and that means there's fewer jobs, fewer firms, less productive capacity, you know, maybe less research and development. And in these times, that's actually what we need more of. Uh, we need more competition and in many ways, a bigger buffer to withstand these types of shocks, whether they be economic or, you know, a health emergency. I also think a lot about agility at the local level, agility at the regional level, agility at the national level. You know, we heard earlier, if you're waiting for critical medical supplies to be shipped across the Pacific, that is not going to allow you to quickly be able to respond. And if we see in the United States, as well as in the EU, much of the response is at that regional and local level. And to be able to get the key goods and materials to respond is just so critical. And it's not just about masks or pharmaceutical ingredients. It goes beyond that as well. So in many ways, consolidation and mergers, you know, also really put that at risk. The last point is I'm really looking hard at the markets today. And I see something very similar to what we saw uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis a decade ago, that the largest firms are going to be able to quickly access special emergency credit facilities, other bailouts, while smaller and mid-sized firms are, are really on the brink and struggling. And so when those large firms can recover first, they can be ready to go in for the kill later. They can do more to scoop up smaller players at the regional level. They can do more to uh, engage in killer acquisitions of, of potential competitors. And so if we're trying to think about both resilience in the context of shocks, as well as about what we will absolutely need to think as a country and as a globe about economic recovery, you know, making sure that that buffer exists, making sure that there's that local, regional, and national agility making sure that we are guarding against the mass roll-ups or consolidation that can occur later as large firms recover first. And, and I think no one is arguing that firms that offer lousy products and services should, should artificially stay afloat. In fact, failure and orderly bankruptcy is a critical component for a functioning market. But Mass consolidation uh, and unchecked mergers can really create systemic risks that, are, in, in fact, are very difficult to measure. And the current approaches that economic policymakers use and even antitrust enforcers, 
I don't think really is well calibrated to these types of moments. And, and I, I worry that the fixation on efficiency, that, that's, it, that's dangerous and it's completely at odds with resilience. So, you know, this pandemic and the proposed moratorium that Congressman Cicilline discussed earlier today, I think that's going to force us all to really rethink that. Okay. I want to ask you one follow-up question. I also just want to remind anyone who's not speaking to mute themselves so that we don't get interference. Um, let me ask you, um, Commissioner Chopra, and I should have I should have introduced you earlier as FTC Commissioner. Um, how do you think about the role of the big tech companies at the moment? I mean, they're in a very interesting position. They were under a lot of fire for um, monopoly issues, competition issues before the crisis. But as we know, some of the companies that are doing best in the crisis right now are these firms. I mean, basically anybody who's virtual, cash rich, debt poor is doing pretty well. Some of them, like Amazon, are, are being considered, um, you know, quite quite crucial to um, to getting us through this this moment. Um, others, like Google and Apple, are coming up with, you know, coming together in in new ways to come up with tracking mechanisms. They're they're getting into new areas like healthcare, um, financial data. I mean, these were areas that they were trying to get into before COVID, and there was a lot of pushback. Now it's like there's been a, a sea change um, almost, you know, short term anyway, in the public, how the public views this. How do you think about it? What, what should we be doing? Are there, are there, if we are gonna allow more data gathering by these firms, should there be um, legislative limits put in place about how, the, how data can be used over what period of time? How do you see that? Well, first, th there's so many dimensions to this one, uh, I think, Many of us who uh, are regulators, you know, my, my personal fe my personal feeling right now is when there is going to be a real effort to engage in greater mass surveillance, the fact that the FTC and policymakers in the United States really haven't succeeded at putting together some a real policy on protecting against abuse of personal data really worries me. Um, look, I think that one of the things we learned a decade ago is that there are certain firms in the economy that are the plumbing of our society and economic productivity. And we thought about that quite a bit in the banking context, which is that how a failure of one of those firms could uh, lead to disastrous con uh, consequences for the rest of the globe. And you know, in this situation, uh, I've actually been asking myself a lot, what, what would actually happen if some of these large tech companies, what if one of them experienced a major shock? What if one of the, them experienced, you know, whether it's a physical attack or whether it was a major breach or whether, whatever it might be, I worry about our ability to recover from that mm. because it's such a fundamental plumbing of the economy. So in some ways, you know, my concerns are amplified about concentrating too much economic activity in a, in a small set of firms. But, you know, we're also in the United States, there's a lot of discussions about the use of the Defense Production Act. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, policymakers are talking about what ways to use that. And I think there is concern about outsourcing key government functions into, you know, large, powerful firms and what the consequences of that are. So in some ways, I think this actually, this actually uh, really sharpens our need to make sure that we really understand the consequences of consolidation, the consequences of firms engaged in, you know, thousands of acquisitions, and in fact, the FTC has issued orders to study uh, those acquisitions by firms in the tech industry. So, you know, for me, it, it actually increases my resolve to make sure that we get to the bottom of all the potential harms that the current market structure may, uh, may be exacting broadly on society and the economy. That's interesting. You're you're touching on a question that's come in too about, you know, are there certain sectors that are absolutely necessary for human health, healthcare, food, water, 
is it, it, it should those be left to the market? Should there be limits in terms of what private companies can do? And so um, we'll, we'll come back to that. I wanna though bring in Christina Kafara, who's the head of European competition practice at Charles River Associates. Um, Christina, I wanna, I wanna ask you to sort of flesh out how the EU is thinking about competition policy in light of the crisis. The EU was already really moving in some interesting new directions before this. I mean, in particular, I was quite struck by the way in which Europe was starting to really put the onus on some of the big firms to prove uh, that they hadn't engaged in wrongdoing rather than creating a situation where small companies are forced to get into long legal battles. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you see happening now. I've heard some European commissioners um, and some staffers saying, actually, we're thinking of getting tougher now on some of the bigger players because we see that companies like, um, like of Google or Facebook can actually do a pretty good job of policing um, information flow and, and, and policing falsehoods during this time of crisis. So maybe you can kind of sketch out how Europe is thinking about all this at the moment and, and what other changes we might see. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm delighted to be on this uh, panel for this timely conversation. Um, I am indeed someone who practices in Europe. I've done so for many years, so I'm keen to really overlay a European perspective on this debate. But uh, I want to pick up on some of the earlier themes that were teed up by uh, Commissioner Chopra and by some of the previous speakers uh, to begin with. Um, Paul Romer, I think, said we uh, cannot trust and to trust the two uh, solve the problems that we are in. And that is very much a position that I think is shared by many. At the same time, it is also true, and we cannot hide ourselves behind a different position that antitrust has been, uh, the way in which we practice antitrust for uh, a long time has been significantly responsible for the position we find ourselves in now. Now, there is a significant challenge now to the purpose and the scope of antitrust, which is a global one and predates the current crisis. Uh, and it is one that really questions the foundation that we have been effectively following for the past 40 years, this notion that we need to have a more economic approach, we need to abandon presumptions about market structure and decentralization, we need to do away with public interest tests, with distribution goals, and this religion of efficiency as being the guiding light as to what we do. Chicago School has a lot to, to answer for, but essentially we ended up in a world in which the way in which antitrust has been practiced in Europe and in the US, but of course Europe has followed very much that Anglo-Saxon approach, has been uh, we need to follow this God of efficiency. All we care about is somehow uh, efficiency in mergers. It means that we care about marginal cost, some, some small price effects, and we have led through all sorts of consolidation. We've seen mergers in sectors taking number of players from 10 to 8 to 9 to 7 in sectors like chemicals, in sectors like uh, pharma. So the rethink has been prompted, I think, more uh, recently, not just, of course, in the context of the pandemic, but by an awareness that somehow we elect markets become concentrated, too concentrated. There is evidence that margins and concentration have increased, but it's broader than that. There is, a, of course, a, an anxiety over digital monopolies, as you, as you mentioned. There is a, a notion that there is this empowerment of inequality and, and, and generally uh, systems when healthcare is broken, people are not serviced. So all of this is not solely the, falls, the, the fault of limited lags for antitrust enforcement, but certainly uh, lacks antitrust enforcement, lack of it has been a, a very significant factor in it. So then we come to the current crisis and this discussion has been going on uh, about the, 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 the faults of antitrust and the, and, the, and the guilt of antitrust in some sense. We come to the current crisis and this is then amplified as we're all discussing here for very good reason, because you have, uh, of course, monopolies, and when you have or, or more concentrated markets in the front of these circumstances, of course, what do monopolies do? They restrict supply even more, they ration more. Uh, you have excessive concentration of production, there's by definition less flexibility. You have systemic risk and externalities, and again, uh, we've been very liberal about allowing assets to go under foreign ownership when it comes to 
um, when it comes to merger control. But now, now uh, you know, we, this paradigm of the open trading economy is very much under question. So uh, this past liberal approach is very much, uh, 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 very much a problem. So uh, clearly, as a general statement, the pandemic has exposed even more and amplified even more a discussion that's been going on in antitrust circles, in policy circles, for some time. We have applied antitrust in ways that are too narrow, too technocratic, too restrictive, without seeing the wood from the trees. We've been obsessed with efficiencies, not with distribution. We have pursued goals that are undeserving, and that's where we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, then uh, you have uh, the broad discussion about what we need to do to deal with that. And the proposal of uh, Congressman Cicilline is certainly something uh, quite uh, interesting. Now, let me overlay on that briefly, the European perspective, because what I've sketched is the global antitrust narrative. In Europe, there are some interesting strands which actually pull in a number of different directions. And it is going to be extremely interesting to see where we end up. Because of course, in Europe, we've also been in the midst of a revisionism of the role and purpose of antitrust, sure, but it isn't been driven by the same American narrative that says we have let markets concentrate too far. There is some strand of that. Um, actually, Europe is in a different place right now. Uh, the political debate, particularly now that Britain has left the Brexit, we are finding ourselves in a more French, French and German leadership of Europe, in which what is very acute is a sense of the fragility of Europe as a continent, uh, effectively loomed over by US monopolies, loomed over by marauding Chinese, and we in the middle are actually pretty scared and pretty worried about what is gonna happen to us. And the debate then now goes, competition policy needs to become much more a subordinate objective to industrial policy, because we need to deal with the position that Europe finds itself in. The position that Europe defines itself in is one of concern. Where is our industrial base going? How can we compete with all of this? So there is good industrial policy to which competition policy can be a co-player. Good industrial policy that's about you know, incentives for innovation, partnership and investment, uh, favoring growth, that's good. But there is also another industrial policy, which is actually the one that is prevalent in the discussion now in Europe. And it is about effectively a defensive view of Europe needing to concentrate more internally, do Europe uh, pan-European national champions in order to be capable of defending itself against global aggressors including a strand of allowing government to take shares into international companies in order to reject potential predatory instincts by foreign companies. So really actually before the pandemic set in, we were seeing a complete sea change in Europe about the competition narrative and the role of antitrust. It not being uh, uh, an independent pursuit of efficiency, as it had been, more or less, with, with sort of qualification, but there's a much more explicit tool of an industrial policy that is intended to pursue in, in some way the, the, the sort of uh, strengthening of the weaker European uh, firms. Uh, not, not the efficient ones, but there is a sense in which we need to then allow mergers yeah. to occur. We need to actually be laxer in the merger control that we've applied so far. The big discussion about Siemens and Alstom merging last year, prevented by the European Commission today, I'm not so sure this merger would be prohibited in the current circumstances, because um, it is very clear that the objective is a different one. Now, it is interesting because this narrative of LA's, as you say, when it comes to digital giants, Certainly an activism, the European Commission has been one of the most active regulators around the world to deal with uh, uh, the digital giants. It has a number of investigations under, underway. You know, I feel very smug when I talk to American colleagues and say, well, what have you done? You know, catch up with us. 
but uh, it is true that uh, this pursuit is continuing, but there is also a very strong sense we need to actually do our own data sovereignty, our own data autonomy, our own pooling of data. We need to append some of the unhelpful competition rules because they won't allow us to do that. So to conclude, I think that the developments in Europe are somewhat similar to the US. There is a, 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 a strand that is aware that competition policy needs to be tighter, but there is also a very significant body of politicians and policymakers who are actually pushing in a different direction for a different policy objective. So that in the play will be very significant in the coming, in the coming months and years. Okay, you have set up so many fascinating topics, and I'm going to be calling you at some point for an interview because I love this. Um, but let me let me tease you out on a couple of things because I, I hear sort of two different visions here. I mean, on the one hand, Europe has been really ahead on thinking about monopoly, really setting, you know, kind of setting the global policy framework there. But there's also, I mean, there is research to show, I'm thinking about Thomas Philippon's book, The Great Reversal, to show that actually one of Europe's strengths has been a variety of smaller companies versus these sort of you know me mega mega US or Chinese firms. So how do you preserve that environment? And you know, I mean, really in the midst of this crisis, that sort of Germanic Mittelstand you know um, model seems very resilient, very robust right now. Well, um, yeah, sorry. No, just, I'll book I'll bookmark that. I'm trying to get in two questions very quickly, so so I can get you on the book. And then we're hearing from from listeners something that I want to I want to get you to speak to, which is the third way that Europe is sketching out in this new world that we we've often you know heard about a bipolar world, U.S. and China, but in the case of supply chains, Europe is very much in the middle, being pulled constantly politically in both ways. Certainly around 5G, the Huawei versus Qualcomm thing has been very politicized. Can Europe? have a third way what does that involve and you mentioned industrial policy i mean do you do you imagine that europe is going back more to a kind of a franco-german system of national champions in all this so maybe you can quickly speak to both those things i will try um i i, I think that uh you know you, <laughs> I'm 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 a bit pessimistic about where things are going because what the, the what the pandemic is exaggerating is certainly very much the the framework of nation states and we are I think in a situation in which there's been a German response a, uh, an Italian response a French response to it and I do not know again as one of the sort of sources of uncertainty where where that is going is going to lead us at the end of this in terms of a vision but. You are right that uh, the sort of SMEs, the Mittelstadt in Germany is very much what drives the current thinking at uh, the commission. In a world in which Brexit has led to Britain kind of weighing anchor and drifting into mid-Atlantic on its own, this is a Franco-German commission. Let's not make any mistake. And the protection of that Mittelstadt, the protection of the German, uh, of the German car industry, the protection of Airbus and of the French industry is very paramount, which is why you can see now precisely that. Uh, I worry about, to some extent, these, uh, these, these instincts and these, and these uh, particular objectives coming to really mess up further what is a discussion about the role of antitrust, which should be, guys, we've been too lenient. We lot let things concentrate in ways that were not helpful on the pursuit of this efficiency myth. We are now possibly going to see actually even laxer antitrust because we want to preserve the and, and somehow protect the European, the European environment. So, I, I, I think there are a number of forces pulling in different directions which mm. we're going to live with. And that is, that is, I think, an additional complication to the U.S. Interesting. Let me, in the, just, we're really at time, but, but Rohit, I want to give you a moment just to have a last word. And I'm going to ask you to respond to a question that's come through, um, which I think is interesting. Was James Tobin right? Has capitalism become too efficient? Do we need to build in frictions, redundancy, rather than eliminate them? What are the implications of this for 
the EU's core value of free movement of capital, people, services, and trade. But I think that you could expand that to kind of global systems in general. So I'm going to let you have the last word on this. Yeah, well, look, I think it, this, this word efficient in some ways has become uh, synonymous with stripping meat off the bone um, and hacking and cutting. You know, there are things that make us more productive, um, and, but often that involves real capital investment. So I think the, the intersection with these global capital markets where uh, really a lot of the benefits and the fruits of production don't really flow to the regions and localities and the individuals, um, you know, that, that does create some real problems. And I think it is true that the way we, we withstand shocks, uh, whether they be economic or what we're dealing with today or both, um, that's going to require a rethinking of how the structure of markets and the economy works. And, you know, on this question of national champions, I just want to share something, Rana. I, I am worried that we're hearing, uh, you know, comments from people like Sheryl Sandberg and others that essentially it comes down to a few of these firms really need to be protected by the United States or their government in order to, uh, you know, position the West vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. I, and I really, I, I think this is a, a somewhat dangerous mindset because when we really look at where we've been driving innovation, it is often when we have a very large ecosystem of smaller players. So in the pharmaceutical industry, it completely depends on having hundreds or thousands of smaller biotech players. It, it, even in... Uh, Technology services, consumer internet services. You know, Facebook didn't invent what uh, Instagram. Google didn't invent YouTube. It requires this ecosystem. And yes, those large firms who sit on many, many billions of dollars of cash are able to act like a hedge fund or capital markets function. Yes, in that sense, they're driving in innovation. But that can also be done in other ways. So I. I think if we look at the history of the U.S., we made as a country such substantial contributions in discoveries across science, technology, medicine, but it was partially because we believed in this idea of vigorous competition by not just three or four players, but by hundreds or thousands. So. We need to remember that as we're looking to engineer growth out of this severe recession that we're looking at and what are going to be the drivers of jobs, the drivers of innovation, yeah. the drivers yeah. of growth. And I don't want uh, a few powerful players that are being protected by their country um, you know, to choke that off. So we need to be thinking about all of this as we go forward and and create an economy that's going to get us out of this. Well, you're, you're bringing up a couple of really key points that maybe I can summarize and wrap on, which is that um, a lot of the private sector wealth um, that we see now concentrated in, you know, the top 10% of companies was in part government funded. So the, there's, there's always a public private sector um, um, dance being done here, but also that most innovation, and there's plenty of academic research that shows this tends to happen in smaller companies, often before they go public. Those companies need to be protected. That's particularly front and center in the bailout discussions right now, which we would need a whole nother panel for. And in fact, I did that conference yesterday, so I won't go into that. But um, uh, let me um, let me just run up, run. This is Angel Guria. Just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I always say that Gabriela has the um, has uh, uh, the uh, uh, the. The, the best job in the OECD, including mine, by the way, uh, basically because she gets to speak to people like yourselves and uh, you're the ones who are helping us think about what's ahead. Uh, you know, our, our motto is better policies for better lives, but basically you're the one who gives us the ideas about the policies 
and we have to sell it to the countries uh, so that they will have better lives. It's not always easy to translate from the better ideas to the policy because we have to deal not only with uh, economic policy, but also with the political economy of things. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you. So please, uh, now I back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining. And really, thanks to everybody and to Barry. This is just a star-studded um, group of people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking notes furiously and, and thinking of new column ideas. Um, Barry, I'm going to now hand over to you, I think, for the next panel, yeah? Yes. Um, and uh, thank you, Rana. It's, uh, as the Secretary General said, uh, that was truly an excellent job. Uh, Rana, uh, you pretty much defined the journalist uh, as reporter and as expert. Um, you know, normally at this point, this would be a time for uh, a coffee break. Um, I, in today's world, uh, you're responsible for the coffee. You'll have to uh, make your own coffee and serve it yourselves. Um, so uh, we need to move on to the third panel, but uh, uh, before we do that, I wanted to uh, sort of note a couple of things. Uh, one is um, uh, I would encourage everybody to read a, an article, an op-ed that uh, Senator Rubio published last week in the New York Times. Um, uh, Senator Rubio, we, we actually invited, we almost had a couple of participants from uh, Senator Rubio's office. Uh, and uh, fortunately, it couldn't uh, happen at the last minutes. Um, but I uh, just wanted to note that uh, uh, Senator uh, Rubio has got some very interesting ideas that are pertinent to this very discussion, uh, and uh, it's worth uh, uh, paying attention to those. Uh, another uh, quick note, um, you know, it's really very exciting to see this coming together of people from across the political spectrum across the political spectrum here in the United States and across the political spectrum in Europe. Uh, and this coming together of people from across the Atlantic community. Um, but I also wanna note that um, the Open Markets Institute and the New Approaches to Economic uh, Challenges Initiative at the OECD, we, this is just the first, we hope, of a series of conversations. These conversations will be bringing in more additional voices in the uh, days to come. Uh, one of the next, we're aiming to bring in voices and, uh, and concerns from around the world, including from India, from Africa, Latin America, and from China. And uh, just building on a, a comment by uh, uh, Commissioner uh, 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 Chopra and also uh, by Dr. Osterholm earlier, uh, we must be working with China on these issues, even as we structure our uh, supply chains as we restru restructure our industrial systems, we must be working very China. We are all in this together. You know, smart competition policy, as we are learning today, equals resiliency. Smart competition policy al also equals community. It can equal global community. Um, so on that note, um, we are going to move to the, now to the uh, panel three. We have four uh, terrific systems thinkers. And uh, the point of this next uh, panel is to sort of talk about how we are going to design the systems of tomorrow, the industrial systems, the financial systems, the international political systems, learning from the lessons um, that we've heard thus far about uh, the failures of our industrial systems and also the, uh, the role that competition policy played in, in setting up the environment for those failures. Um, we have with us uh, Sir Paul Tucker. He is the chair of the Systemic Risk Council. Uh, Paul was uh, deputy director at the Bank of England and he sat on its monetary policy, financial stability and prudential policy committees. Uh, he is a member of the G20 Financial Stability Board. Uh, Paul is also a uh, author of Unelected Power, uh, uh, which uh, published in 2018 by uh, Princeton University. It's terrific to have Paul with us. Uh, Mike Masters uh, is with us. He's an old friend. Uh, he is the founder and managing uh, member of Masters Capital Management in Atlanta. Mike is also one of the more important reformers in financial regulation, a real hero. Uh, he led the efforts to get better control over the derivatives uh, market during the last uh, financial crisis. Uh, Mike's work has been covered on 60 Minutes, CBS News, the BBC, the New York Times, and many other outlets. 
And in 2010, uh, Mike took his concern about the harmful effects of unregulated markets, and he uh, used that to inspire him to establish better markets, which is to promote the transparency, accountability, and oversight in domestic and global capital and commodity markets. We also have another uh, uh, fantastic person with us today, Ganesh Sitaraman. He is a professor of law at Vanderbilt. He is one of America's leading young thinkers on the future structure of political economic systems, both domestically and internationally. Um, um, has worked very closely with Senator Elizabeth Warren over the years, but he has also worked with people across the political spectrum. Uh, you know, he's a, a connector. Um, uh, Ganesh is the author of two of a number of really important books. I'll mention two, uh, The Great Democracy, which came out recently, and The Crisis of the Middle Class Constitution, which came out about three years ago. Great books. And last, we have Doyne Farmer, one of the world's most well-known experts on complex systems, uh, working both as a scientist as an entrepreneur on subjects uh, including chaos theory and complexity. Um, uh, P professor Farmer, uh, he's a professor of mathematics uh, where he is the director of complexity economics at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School. And um, his um, current research is on complexity economics and it focuses on systemic risk and financial markets. And in recent months, he's been working a lot on supply chains. Uh, one little note, uh, the chair of our board at Open Markets is an economist named Marcellus Andrews. And I wanted to just note his uh, help in sort of putting this, this, uh, uh, this meeting together. Uh, uh, Marcellus was the person who connected me to uh, Doyne Farmer, for instance, and uh, uh, Marcellus has been a, a true friend for many years and uh, a true intellectual partner in this work. Um, so our point today now is to look at what lessons should we learn from the reports on supply chain consolidation? Uh, what principles should we apply to the process of creating the regulatory guidelines and philosophies of the next world systems? Um, and uh, I just want to note, this is not merely a task of sort of planning for the next pandemic. This is a, uh, uh, this is a task of making these systems resilient in a way that allows them to be absorb any shock, whether it's by an earthquake, uh, whether it's a storm, whether it's a political shock. We need to have systems that stand up all the time, that support our societies. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna, we're going to go first to uh, 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 Mr. Tucker. Paul, are you with us? Yeah, can you see? I'm off mute and I'm, and my camera is on and I can see myself. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating and I'm very glad to be participating. But I was also glad, Barry, if I may say so, that, that you mentioned that this should be the kind of concern that is shared across the political spectrum. And I, and I say that because I think that we will achieve less in, in resilience policy the more it gets bundled up with a package of policies to pursue particular, whether it be conservative agendas or progressive um, agendas. And the reason I emphasize that is this is the kind of disaster that goes to the very stability and security and safety of our societies. I mean, remember the first political question is how can we ensure the security, stability, and safety of our societies and as a basis for cooperation? That's a very Hobbesian um, point, of course. The, our answer to it isn't Hobbesian at all. It's that the degree of coercion that the state applies in, in maintaining those things has to be acceptable to us as citizens. And the liberal answer to that is not very coercive um, at all. But the reason I'm saying that is A, that is shared almost across the reasonable political spectrum in our societies as a starting point. And secondly, that this is the kind of um, crisis that does threaten um, stability because it threatens the safety of our citizens, as do, as you said, um, war, earthquakes, sometimes financial crises, um, sometimes terrorism. And one of the first points I want to make is that it's 
going to be incredibly important in the coming years to ensure that different parts of the public sector don't focus on pandemic risk to the exclusion of all others. So something that happened in my former world, central banking, on both sides of the Atlantic and on both sides of the English Channel, was that central banks and financial regulators after 9-11 focused on terrorism risk. There were many exercises about terrorism risk, and the number of exercises about fi pure financial crises went down until there was a financial crisis, after which the number of exercises on terrorism risk and on pandemic risk went down. And we just need to be much more comprehensive, um, not just in banking, for goodness sake, but across um, different parts of government on the disasters that we need to prepare for. I want to make remarks under three headings, resilience, dependence, in, and, um, and incentives. On resilience, the first point I'd make is, I think it is, a number of people have implicitly made this point, it is much, it is much better to focus on the resilience of different systems than where is the next crisis coming from. One of the things that went wrong in my old field, particularly in the United States, is let's set up bodies that will spot where the next financial crisis is coming from. I never had much truck with that. And actually, the people at the top of the policymaking tree internationally focused much more on making the international system resilient, irrespective of where the, um, the next crisis was coming from. And I'm not claiming that we did a brilliant job, but I think the focus was the right kind of focus rather than early warning systems for far away um, risks. The second thing I would say related to that is it's really important to distinguish between um, economic activities, particular types of business that have an infrastructural um, type function and where that infrastructure um, is, is vital to, the, to society um, and to the economy. So one of the speakers mentioned um, the problems, uh, which I broadly share, represented by um, Facebook and Google and so on. If Facebook shut tonight, I doubt very much whether that would be an, um, I mean, the people would be very fed up about it and some people would, it would damage some people, there's no doubt about that. It wouldn't be on the same scale as the banking crisis, let alone on the same scale of what we're facing now. In the great scheme of things, it would be an inconvenience. Um, whereas if certain infrastructure providers in other parts of the economy failed, like the pay, if the payment system closes tonight, what little um, economic activity is left will almost end in a world where people, for understandable reasons, don't want to focus on cash. So identifying which services are vital and which infrastructure provider, providers are vital to um, the provision of those services. And that's where I think a certain type of competition policy comes in, making sure that our, our economies are absolutely not dependent upon one or even two um, providers. The, the, the second thing I would say under that is, is and th this is a point for government, is that on, in all of the major advanced economy democracies, Governments compared with two generations ago outsource a lot of services. Um, they rely on outsource, outsourced company providers. So they, have, they face a problem if those outsourcing companies fail, which happened in the, in the UK um, a few years ago with a firm, I think, called Carillion. And my point isn't based on its particular circumstances. What was striking to me about that was that although the British government was largely dependent upon that firm for all sorts of services, there had been almost no provision um, for what would happen if the firm got into financial distress, even though precisely that um, policy question had been preoccupying finance ministries and central banks in the banking sphere. So, And the US government is, is dependent upon all sorts of external service providers. And it should identify the top whatever and what happens if they fail for whatever reason. How do they get recapitalized? How are services um, maintained? The, the third thing I would say in, under resilience is we have to be um, alert to when changes in technology 
um, shift contingency planning or resilience planning from shift something from being best practice to being worst practice. And I will give an example. So after 9-11, it was widely regarded as best practice, a dreadful expression, by the way, but nevertheless, one that's widely used, best practice to do real-time backups for all one's IT into physically distant sites. But of course, once cyber warfare arrived, actually real-time backup almost flipped from being best practice to worst practice, because it meant that if the virus um, got into your main site, it was also likely to get in in real time into your backup site. So what counts as, as resilience depends very much on technology. And we should never forget that the ultimate backup to digital is analog. If we want to be, if we want to be resilient against the internet being um, switched off, then we should have physical copies of some of the things we need. T two briefer comments, if I may, I'll be very quick, um, on dependence and incentives. Autarky is not an option. I thought the congressman sounded attracted by the concept of autarky. And yet there are some, some areas, and actually a pandemic is one of them, where only an international approach um, um, can work because the weakest link is a problem to us all. Similarly, though, we can be overly dependent. And the, one of the biggest questions that policymakers face is, do we want to be dependent for critical things only on um, states who we regard as absolutely copper-bottomed allies? Or do we even not want to be dependent upon them? And if we say, if we say no, we don't even want to be dependent upon our copper-bottomed allies, that will, that will send a signal that will spill over into all sorts of other fields, including security alliances. On the other hand, if we say, well, we, we can be overly dependent upon allies, but we cannot be overly dependent upon others, then, of course, we will be crystallizing the hierarchy of allies and potential enemies that we have, and that may, that may not be avoidable. And so these questions about economic and social resilience are absolutely going to, going to dovetail with security policy in the kind of Pentagon sense and the geopolitical struggles that lie ahead. My suspicion is that a world of, of roughly concentric circles will in slow motion um, um, emerge, not by design, but not by holistic design anyway, but by a, a set of steps where we conclude that trading with China is a good thing for some for, for all sorts of goods and services and a bad thing for others. Finally, on incentives. A, a lot has been said about the incentives of people in the private sector. We should be a sen in, sensitive to the incentives of people in the public sector. We are learning in a number of major advanced economy democracies that pandemic was the number one identified risk, and yet little was done um, about it. And in my country, there were fewer incentive care um, unit beds than there were in, in Germany. And the interesting question there is, for me, is was this an instance of moral hazard, that actually people that run the health service had to make cuts, and they chose to make them in, in intensive care? And I think I would say that that kind of choice needs to be made at political level, not at technocratic um, level. And finally, the last thing I would say, um, it hasn't come up at all, is the insurance industry is going to try and, and well, it, it, will, it will say that its contracts don't cover all sorts of things. And those things that it does cover, it may be unwilling to insure afterwards. Something that happened in the UK about 25 years ago is that the state acts explicitly as insurer of last resort for terrorism. And it may well be that the state has to act as insurer of last resort, not just de facto exposed, but de jure up front. For, for other kinds of risk um, as well. And I, and what I've tried to do is list things which I think could be candidates where people would agree and develop whether they were on the progressive or conservative end of politics. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we're gonna go next to um, Mike Masters. Hey, Barry, <clears throat> uh, thanks for uh, setting this up with uh, open markets and uh, happy to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about more just uh, markets, capital markets, financial markets, 
And um, I thought I would I would really start off just really talking about sort of the default um, <clears throat> uh, framework that I think most market participants and many companies as well, uh, whether publicly traded or private, still have. And that is this this idea of uh, I call it the cult of efficiency. Uh, and I, I know some of the, some of your other guests have talked about this uh, today, but I think it's it's really important. And um, um, it, it's it's really the idea that that if efficiency is is sort of the maximized versus versus everything else. And um, if anybody, you know, my comments and I, um, if anybody's interested in going into this in more detail, if you Google anthropic finance. Uh, uh, I wrote a series of papers, a couple of papers a few years ago, uh, right after the period of financial reform during Dodd-Frank, where I sort of went into this sort of the, the philosophy behind <clears throat> this idea of maximizing efficiency versus other um, societal goals. And uh, so if you Google anth anthropic finance, um, you can, um, they'll come up, I think, at the top of the page, some of the, some of the PBS. But um, uh, at any rate, uh, <clears throat> if, if, if you think about it, if we, if we maximize efficiency, then we're minimizing other societal goals and values. And I'm, I'm really talking about with markets. And markets really should be reflective of society as a whole. They shouldn't just be, they're not a, a, a deity or something like that. They're, 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 are, are, they're an allocation mechanism that we use in society to to allow us to transact via price. And this idea that, and, and, and some of it's inculcated in the efficient markets hypothesis and, and other ideas, uh, this, this, this market fundamentalism, this idea, that they all come back to, to the idea of maximizing efficiency. And what we, what we really should be doing, uh, instead of maximizing efficiency, is doing an optimization um, and having balance in our markets, in our market structure. Uh, you know, so what some people would say, Pareto equilibrium, trying to get to a situation where other societal values, such as resiliency or transparency or even justice are inculcated in, in, our, in our markets. Um, that would be a much better situation for us all in society and would lead to a more durable and robust and stable um, capital markets and commodity markets framework than, than we have today. But I, I just wanted to address that because I still think even, even 10 years after the financial crisis, I still think that's sort of the default economic philosophy of a lot of market participants and many in the economics profession. And I feel like that, that, that we need to look at that first before we re really look at, at other things. And so I, what I'd like to now is just talk about some of the ways in which um, you know, two examples where, you know, we've had, I think, a success in inculcating this idea of resilience and robustness and durability, for instance, into markets. And one, one practice that's actually, I think, uh, hurts uh, that, that and actually contributes to the maximization of, of efficiency, which is, I, I think, something we really want to avoid. And then, I, then I'll talk about uh, something that we can do in the future that I think would be helpful to bringing out um, this idea that you know society could inculcate other values like resilience into into markets, and so the first the, the first thing I'll talk about is the success, and then really that's Dodd Frank. And so with Dodd Frank, um, many of you all are familiar with it. Uh, it was passed in, in 2010, and it really built up capital in the U.S. financial system. And um, as many of you all may know, I mean uh, building up capital in the financial system uh, at banks uh, by default means that their returns on capital goes down because you have more capital um, uh, on, on your, your, the same base of loans and so your returns almost uh, mathematically go down. And so many of the banks, many of the financial institutions fought at that time and they continue to try to, to, to steadily um, bring it down uh, and, and you know, you know, cut at its edges and, and, and use rulemakings and other kinds of things that are involved. That are, that are part of the, the framework to, uh, to slow it down, court cases and, and, and so forth. So it's sort of a never ending battle, but uh, importantly, um, it, has, it has really triumphed so far, and I, and I think it will continue to in this particular crisis that we're in. Uh, if you could imagine having an economic crisis that's caused by a pandemic 
and then having a banking crisis on top of that. Um, that would be an absolute disaster. And because the banks uh, have capital and they've been regulated, really during this crisis, they can intermediate credit to the rest of the economy, which is something that they couldn't do in 2008 and 2009 during the financial crisis because they're, they were capital impaired. So not only did they have to help themselves first, but they couldn't help everybody else because they couldn't intermediate credit. Today, they can intermediate credit. They have excellent balance sheets relative to, to history. And I think that they, they will be in fine shape uh, over, this, you know, over this crisis. And they can work with central banks to help intermediate credit to, to the real economy, which needs it. And so that's an example of, of something that where we, trade, we, we had a trade-off for societal benefit of resiliency versus efficiency, which would have only helped um, the, the banks themselves and their return on capital. But by, by making capital higher for everyone, we made the system safer and better. And so that's, that's, sort of, that's, a, that's a success in my view. And it's ongoing, we have to continue to work on it, but, but at any rate, you know, here it is. And something, uh, another financial practice I would suggest is not so good is the practice, and this is very popular with pension funds and, and, and asset institutional asset allocators around the world, is the practice of private equity. And the problem with private equity is, is, is it contributes to the, this idea of maximizing efficiency uh, at the expense of, of, of uh, resilience. So a typical public company would be levered maybe three times or less. Uh, there's, there's, there's some exceptions, but many, many non-financial companies are levered three times um, debt to EBITDA, which is a standard sort of ratio we use in financial markets and, and, and contribute to a reorganization or, or even a liquidation of these companies which then of course contributes to unemployment, it contributes to uh, loss of factories, loss of, loss of uh, manufacturing, loss of, uh, you know, basically just goes on and on. And that's a practice that, that I think that we should, as, as in, with, with institutional investors, we should try to discourage because um, we, we don't want companies to be living right on the knife's edge. We want companies to, to, to have more stability. And so, one of the things that I think that we can do about that in terms of a, of a, a best practice and something that we already have a sort of a pseudo framework for is we have this, this, this new uh, structure of markets that, 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 is, that is popular and is getting more popular, which is ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance practices. And I would propose that in the G part, the governance part, we would put out uh, we would encourage durability and resilience in the, in companies that are that investors invest in, i.e., durability and resilience in their supply chains. Now, having multiple supply chains may be less efficient, but it's certainly more resilient. And investors should encourage that because over a cycle, the company has a has a much higher likelihood of survival and and ability to prosper over a cycle by having resilience. And in addition. Investors should be looking at balance sheets and looking at the capital structure of companies and saying, look, is this, is this structure, is this capital structure in the balance sheet, is it really sustainable? Does it really have resi resilience? Um, maybe there should be ratios at which ESG governance aspects, you know, anything over three times leverage for non-financial corporates, for instance, should be discouraged. So these are just some, you know, some brief ideas. Um, but I think that, um, you know, using ESG as a framework, we could encourage companies to do these things. Whereas, you know, you, if they were using a, a weighted average cost of capital or some of, some of the, the, the traditional finance or economic theory work in their, in their capital structure, they would be probably more levered. And we need to encourage them to be less levered and, and more durable, more resilient. So at any rate, so, so the idea is, is to triumph over the cult of efficiency and, and, and have some of some of other values that we hold dear in society to be inculcated in markets and have more of a, a balanced market approach. So thank you. Well, Mike, that's, uh, that was terrifically helpful. And actually that's, uh, you've just brought forth a, uh, a really important example of decent success that uh, at sort of regulating systems to ensure that they're much more resilient in a crisis. And uh, so, and that's a, a a very encouraging thing that we uh, kind of need today is actually knowing that human beings are actually quite capable of, uh, even today, even in times are quite capable of making things better. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to, we're going to go now to uh, Ganesh and Ganesh is going to sort of talk about uh, sort of, you know, what the next international system uh, might look like. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, and we look forward to hearing from Ganesh now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barry. Uh, and thanks to everyone for, for joining in uh, and for putting this together. Um, it's terrific to be here and the conversation has been really exciting so far. I thought what I would do is, is zoom out a little bit before we think about uh, how to design or what the components of a design looking forward might look like. Um, and I wanna just start with a basic point that's been pretty commonly noted throughout the morning, uh, but I just wanna put a fine point on it, which is that resilience is a legal and policy choice. Uh, it is something that we can choose to do and that our policy choices allow us to do. It's not something that um, emerges uh, necessarily from a state of nature or something like that. And, and context matters quite a bit. We can decide through those policies how much concentration, how much globalization, how much shareholder pressure, uh, how much of any of these things we want to accept in a system. You know, Rana mentioned earlier this, this challenge that there's often a thought that you either have to move to a fully laissez-faire system or uh, some form of extreme regulation, when in reality, uh, all of our societies and, and economies have been built somewhere in the middle of those things. And that is the domain of making these kind of policy choices. Um, and I think what we've seen is throughout our history, we've made different policy choices at different times. You know, from the end of World War II through, I, I would characterize it as, the, as about the uh, late 1970s, uh, we had a system of regulated capitalism uh, in the United States and, uh, and in much of, much of Western Europe. Um, and this system involved uh, keeping the boundaries around the, the markets, but at the same time also uh, having a lot of space within national governments to provide the kinds of welfare states and benefits that were needed. It was different in different places, um, but there was a sort of system that understood capitalism had to have some bounds. Uh, we then entered what I would call a neoliberal era in which deregulation, privatization, liberalization, and austerity uh, were the dominant modes of economic policy making, at least as a mood or an approach, uh, both on the left and on the right. Um, and I think that has been a, a, a second feature of, of, of this period. Um, what's striking about that period is that it's really made us in a lot of ways uh, less resilient um, and it has caused a variety of problems uh, that we're seeing now. Um, the, the lack of public uh, uh, action um, and ability um, and capacity. Uh, we've seen um, massive inequality in our societies that is magnified uh, in this context um, where we see these uh, big disproportionate um, uh, effects of who's being, um, who's being uh, harmed uh, in this crisis. Um, and I think what we also see, I think since the financial crash, especially, but, but in, this, in this moment uh, to an even greater degree is an understanding that there's a great opportunity for a different kind of era to move beyond uh, what we've had over the last generation. Um, and I think as we think about resilience, um, I really think there are three categories in which uh, it's worth thinking um, about how we do resilience. One is the social and political infrastructure uh, in our societies. Um, a second is whether we have resilient markets. And then a third is whether we have resilient international relationships. Um, and as we try to aim for goals of competition and innovation, consumer protection, equal access to goods and services, uh, and resiliency of, of a system as a whole, um, I, I just wanna outline three ways of thinking about, especially the market side, because that's where a lot of our focus today has been. Um, and the first is one we've talked a lot about, which is antitrust and competition policy. Um, as we think about the sources, as we think about geographic uh, resilience, as we think about uh, supply chains, um, thinking about competition uh, and concentration is critical as one angle of that. Um, but a second is regulation. Uh, it's not something we've talked as much about here, but throughout our systems, um, you know, Michael mentioned uh, leverage. Um, thinking about regulation of leverage is a question. It's a regulatory tool um, that works in conjunction with other kinds of tools. Um, and we should be thinking about how regulation affects this, whether that is the level of network regulation in uh, infrastructure industries that can guarantee equal access at a controlled price uh, or the more uh, uh, traditional kinds of regulation that we see on particular behaviors. Um, and then the third is public provision or public options. 
Um, and you know, that's another area where when we think about basic utilities and essential things that people need, uh, direct public provision is often uh, a better way to have a resilient system uh, than uh, a market, given uh, that there may be market failures or other problems if you're trying to ensure equal access uh, to that good or service throughout the, throughout the economy. Um, and, so, and so with that framework in mind, I just as we think about those options, antitrust regulation, public provision, um, as ways to, to think about addressing particular problems, um, I think there are a few uh, tactical uh, choices or elements that we need to keep in mind as we're, as we're thinking about making those choices. Um, the first is what values we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think a lot of people have talked about how efficiency as a value has really dominated almost all other values uh, in the last generation as we've thought about uh, economic policy making. Um, we need to think broader than efficiency. We need to think about power. We need to think about uh, uh, equality. We need to think about competition and resiliency as part of, as part of um, how we think about economic policy. A second factor is we need to think about the kind of dynamic consequences of the policy choices that we make. Um, designing policies in specific ways, you know, allowing, for example, as we have significant market concentration over the last generation, um, has second order effects. Um, an, an effect of that, for example, is massive concentration means the political uh, context changes in which some companies have extraordinary power and ability to lobby governments to influence the making of policy down the road uh, to benefit themselves potentially at the expert uh, at the expense of the public good uh, or public resilience. And then a third factor is to what extent we want structural versus technocratic regulation. Um, and I would put myself in the camp of, of strongly um, recommending structural reforms rather than technocratic ones. I think uh, Paul's mention earlier gets at this, which is, you know, are you trying to seek out what is the precise nature of the next crisis that might come and solve for that? Or are you trying to design a resilient structure that can weather whatever storm might come? Um, and the latter approach, thinking about the structures, I think is a better, uh, a better way that we should think about policy design uh, than focusing on particular technocratic uh, aims. Um, so with that, uh, thanks everyone for, for being here and participating, um, and I'll throw it back to Barry. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. That was, that was terrific. And um, just uh, wanted to uh, move on to uh, Dwayne Farmer. And, uh, and then on the other side of this, I have a couple questions from uh, folks out in the world. And uh, uh, so over to you, Dwayne. You may be muted. All right. Um, supply chains, which I like to think of, I like to call production networks, because supply chains is actually a misnomer. It's not a chain at all. It's a web. And, and it's not just supplying things, it's producing things. And so we really have to think about that because it's the backbone of the economy. It's the most fundamental thing about the economy. You know, the modern production network um, allows us all to specialize in ways that Adam Smith could never have dreamed of. And it, it's a lot of what makes the economic system so powerful. And so, of course, when we have something that really hits it hard, as this crisis is doing, we feel it pretty badly. Um, you know, it's fundamental to the economy in many ways, and I think it's worth keeping in mind. We've been talking a lot about resilience, which I agree is really important. Um, I guess I'm of the view that we're never going to have this perfect. Uh, there are, fundamental forces, evolutionary forces that are always pushing us towards increased efficiency. And that to follow up on a theme that Ganesh said, there's certain ways in which it automatically becomes resilient. If it's getting hit regularly with small shocks, it becomes resilient to those kinds of small shocks. And it is doing that all, all the time. But there's a concept in complex systems called highly optimized tolerance that's now about 20 years old, which is a theory for general complex systems where any time the complex system has a function, we tend to optimize what we do with it. And we lose tolerance to large, rare shocks as a result, which is why uh, so many things tend to have power laws in these kinds of situations, meaning there's heavy tails with extreme events that are gonna hit you hard. So we're fighting a fundamental principle of complex systems when we try and make a, a something like the global production network resilient to shocks. And I strongly agree with Ganesh that 
we need to think about regulation as one of the main ways we can do that. It's not something we can expect it's just going to do by itself. We have to regulate, and the regulation has to have an effect on a global level because there's evolutionary pressure pushing us the other way. Now, but I wanted to say a little bit about a few other properties of supply chains, uh, partly in the spirit of Paul's remarks. Um, climate change. You know, if we're going to get a grip on climate change, we have to have a deep understanding of the global production network. Why? Because the embedded carbon in anything you buy, you know, where how much, how many carbon emissions go into making this iPhone? To know that, I have to know the complete uh, production network of the iPhone, and that production network's at least seven steps deep. So we have to go all the way back to the mining of tantalum and things like that to understand what's going on. And until we actually can record the global production network, we won't be able to do that. The other thing that we've shown understanding production networks is really important for is economic growth itself. That is, we've shown that the speed of economic growth, all else equal, happens faster with deeper supply chains. Why is that? Because anytime you take a product like my iPhone, anytime there's an improvement in any of the things, any of the things that are uh, down upstream from it in the supply chain, like say tantalum mining, if suddenly tantalum becomes a factor of two cheaper, that improvement gets passed on to my iPhone. So the deeper your supply chain, the more possibilities for technological improvement there are along the way. And sure enough, if you go out and look at supply chains and you look at price indices through time, see there's a very clear, unequivocal effect that the deeper the supply chain is, the faster the product tends to improve. So we'd understand a lot more about economic growth if we understood supply chains, particularly because one of the main ways economic growth happens is through the evolution of um, supply chains themselves. And, and let me all just also just say that to understand the pr global production network, really, one really needs to think in ecological terms. Uh, I could come back and say more about that later. Now, so if we could understand the global production network, we could make vastly better economic models. We have a much better understanding of this crisis than we do now. And you know, my team at Oxford is actually busy building models using the best understanding of the global production network we've got. The best understanding we've got is pretty crappy. Um, and that's the limiting factor in our modeling. We're remarkably ignorant at the firm level of what's going on. We know only little pieces of the global production network. Um, we're blocked by confidentiality. People don't let us see what they are actually, what their supply chains are. Now, you know, there, there are, we need to find ways of unlocking that to get past that confidentiality by somehow getting firms to share the key things that we need to know about their supply chain. Um, or we need to regulate to just tell them they've got to share. Chile, for example, has made changes in the way the VAT is recorded so that every time there's an economic transaction in Chile, a legal economic transaction, um, the two counterparties are recorded, the product that was transacted is recorded and the price is recorded. And if you have that information, you can reconstruct the whole supply chain of Chile at the level of individual firms and individual products. That's what we need to be able to do globally to really understand this. It also leads us to other problems like what is the production function? Paul made the point that, you know, if Facebook got knocked out, well, it'd be a minor irritation. But, you know, if our providers of energy got knocked out, we're screwed. And so there's a huge difference between different kinds of production and the role of different kinds of production as inputs to the other links in the production network. And, um, and we don't understand that. You know, we don't understand, there is no good breakdown of questions like how fundamental is this because the way an economist would normally think about a production function would be in terms of the flows of money. And the Facebooks have big flows of money, that doesn't mean they're really essential. We kind of go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs in something like this crisis. 
And when you look at the essential industries, they're the ones that are at the bottom of Maslow's pyramid, the things we absolutely have to have. We're actually having to conduct a survey in real time to understand that in order to have a decent model of how big an economic hit the pandemic is going to cause to the global economy or any national economy for that matter. Um, so if we really want to have better economic models, we have to understand the global production network because it's the most fundamental thing about the economy. We don't have, we have hardly any knowledge about it and we need to be able to make better economic models that we build from the bottom up if we have ever really want to understand macro properly and having data about the global supply network is the fundamental aspect of that. If we had that, we could also do things like stress test its resilience. We can really think about these problems in fine detail. And I think ultimately we're gonna to have to have either some commercial incentive for doing that. I have some ideas about ways to actually incentivize companies commercially or we need regulation. Thank well, you. Uh, thank you, Dwayne. And actually that's a, a just a great teeing up of a way to actually tie a couple of things together that we've heard. Um, you know, you're pointing out the fact that we, it's really hard to see what, where the risk is. We can't actually identify where the choke points are. We can't identify uh, where the, um, um, you know, where the, 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 the location of the, the, the shock may emerge from. And um, earlier today, we heard Yossi Sheffi talk about how, uh, you know, at um, uh, Starbucks, they know where every single one of their many thousands of farmers are, and they know exact. They are able to track just about every bean through their system, and uh, so the technology exists for us to track every single computer trip. The, the technology exists for us to track every single uh, component of every product if we choose to do so. Um, as Ganesh said earlier, I mean the issue is a, a function of, of power. Um, and uh, so the, the people that sort of control these systems, uh, they don't want us to see inside. They don't want uh, people to, un to understand where everything is because that's part of the, the secret sauce. Um, and um, so there's got to be a balance. And I think that's actually one of our challenges in the years ahead is actually to figure out ways to keep certain, uh, for us to uh, see where the choke points are while allowing private corporations to have a certain amount of uh, a secrecy in terms of, um, you know, what they're creating and, and how. Um, so um, one real quick point and, uh, is we're going to be turning it over to Gabriella uh, again in about three minutes. Uh, Gabriella will be sort of uh, introducing the final panel or the final actually sort of wrap up session. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I uh, just had, oh, I wanted to bring in one question that was from uh, sort of outside. And uh, uh, this was a, a person named James Brozovich in Farmington Hills. Uh, and he, he wrote, uh, this panel has raised so many issues that need to be addressed moving forward. It is obvious to me that some sort of sustained political effort is necessary to do this. You know, and who is going to organize that? And who's going to lead that effort? And uh, I want to just uh, ask everyone to answer that question in about two lines. Uh, but before I, I do that, I'm going to actually quote uh, uh, really quickly uh, Jean Monnet. Uh, Jean Monnet was one of the sort of uh, founders of the Modern European Project. And uh, he, um, uh, he was the, one of the founders of the Coal and Steel uh, Agreement, which is the origins of the European Union. And Jean Monnet at one point wrote, people only accept change when they're faced with necessity and only recognize necessity when a crisis is upon them. A crisis is upon us today. And uh, each of you in the two lines, like who, what institutions are necessary or what institutions do we already have uh, that will actually help us achieve this? And I'll uh, just in the order that you spoke. So I guess going to Paul first. And remember, just two lines. It has to be driven by the legislature in our societies and therefore by public pressure on the legislature. And in parliamentary democracies, the executive branch can take it to um, the legislature, but it has to be the legislature. And my fear would be that the fault lines in your constitution mean that everybody will have incentives to leave it to every other branch. Okay, great. And uh, Mike, you're actually muted. So before you come on. Sure, I, I think that um, 
that uh, I would agree with Paul. I would also suggest that uh, legislatures and 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 uh, you know executive branches, for that matter, can be greatly influenced by um, uh, organizations that uh, help them uh, come up with with policies that make sense. And uh, you know, I think you know, with regard for you know regulation, uh, they, there's there's a need for for policy that's focused on regulation. And, um, and I think that's, uh, I think, you know, with our organization, Barry, I think we've been successful with that. I think that uh, your organization has been successful as well. So, any regular. Thank you, Mike. And then Ganesh, you're also muted. So before you give your two lines. Yeah, I, I agree with both of that. I'll, I'll say in a different way though, is I think it's gonna take everyone. Um, it's gonna take organizations, it's gonna take individuals who come up with ideas, it's gonna take individuals who are out clamoring for change from their elected officials, and it's gonna take leaders who are willing to get out there and actually fight for something and lead on, on, those, uh, on these topics. So, you know, th this kind of thing doesn't happen because there's someone to rescue us, it happens because we rescue ourselves and it's gonna take all of us to do it. Great, thank you. And then last, join. I get to agree with everyone, but I'll just add that I think there are commercial incentives that will change things because this crisis is showing firms that if they don't understand their supply chains, they're skating on thin ice and they might understand their immediate supply chains, but they need to go several layers deep. So we need to find a way to provide to firms knowledge about the supply chains in a way that doesn't conflict with their strategic advantage. And I think we can do that. Well, uh, and I, I like the idea of ending on a uh, the idea that's creating commercial incentives to to make this all work. Um, so now we're going to uh, turn it over to Gabriella for the to manage the wrap up. And uh, thank you. It's good to see you again, Gabriella. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for this uh, fantastic panel, and thank you for your speakers and for everybody that has been uh, with us today. It, it has been really enriching, and uh, I'm not yet in the in the closing panel. I want to turn to two of our speakers in the last session uh, and to ask them to uh, make sense of all what we have heard, <laughs> to come out with, uh, with some uh, insights of how much uh, the very impressive set of uh, um, uh, comments and knowledge and uh, issues uh, that all of the panelists have brought this afternoon can really put together to produce uh, better policies. Uh, as Secretary General Gurria mentioned, that's uh, the quest of the OECD, produce better policies for better lives. And the reflection that we had with the Open Market Institute and with Barry, uh, of course, this is not a discussion that happens uh, just because we are interested in these issues. This happens because we are confronted with the major shock, uh, the most important shock in our lifetimes, uh, that made us realize how fragile our systems are, how vulnerable, how unable we were to identify those vulnerabilities and we move from systems to systems on the health side, on the vaccine, on the market for vaccines, on the question of the financial markets, on the question of the supply chains that you have uh, uh, underscored in, in several of the panels, on the question of the political economy, and even on the question of competition policies uh, that we have as one of the most uh, elaborated set of guidance that our governments have. Uh, but at the end, if, if we have a Congress uh, uh, person, a very prominent Congress person who is chairing the Antitrust Commission, asking us to have a moratorium on mergers and acquisitions, uh, and actually he just uh, tweeted that he made this comment here in our uh, joint seminar uh, with Nike and the Open Market Institute. I think that we need to rethink, as all of our speakers have mentioned, uh, the kind of analytical frameworks, tools, and, and definitions uh, in our economic policy toolkit to produce better outcomes. And we are convinced that the systems thinking can provide a lot of insights, uh, but we need to translate that into something practical, something actionable, and something that helps us to be better prepared because it's something is certain is that we are going to have several other shocks. Um, just last year, as I told you, we have this conference on preventing systemic collapse of Nike, and we are very sorry to have uh, been right. Now, let me turn to our commentators, and, and we benefit from uh, the presence of Pascal Lamy, 
thank you, Pascal. You you were the first to connect, uh, along with also Laurence Boon, who is going to join you. Uh, I don't think he needs any presentation, but of course he has been at the core of uh, developing the systems as we having, and he has been also at the core of trying to advance better solutions on the, for the international economy as a former uh, European uh, commissioner and also as a former uh, DG of the World Trade Organization. And now as chairman of the Paris Peace Forum, uh, I mean, he's a steering committee, so he's also my boss on that uh, ground. And on Laurence Boone, who is uh, our chief economist, I think Laurence has been uh, helping uh, the world to understand the impact of the, of the health crisis on the economy. Uh, but she was also the economic advisor of President Hollande and Sherpa to the G20, and also uh, the chief economist of AXA. So the question is very straightforward, uh, Pascal and uh, Laurence. And Paul, I think you also are going to be cheapening. I don't know if you moved to the uh, previous panel or if you are also going to comment on this one, uh, but you have been introduced and, and we have benefited from your insights. So uh, the question is very straightforward. What do we do about it? What do we do, what you have heard? How do we ensure that we use this system thinking to produce better outcomes? Uh, how do we get out of this crisis? And then how do we build more resilient systems as we have been proposing in, in NAIC? And the floor is yours. We start with uh, Pascal, we go with Laurence, and then we go with Paul. Okay, thanks, Gabriela. Uh, good to see you all. Even if I'd like to kiss uh, many of you I see, sorry, not movable, so virtual kiss and handshake for the others. Uh, I've been listening to this conversation from the very beginning. Uh, I found it extremely rich. If there is, I think, one consensus stemming from uh, this morning's discussion, it is that uh, global capitalism uh, will have to be rebalanced and that the pre-COVID balance between uh, efficiency and resilience will have to tilt on the side of resilience. That's, I think, uh, the sort of global conclusion of what has been said. This, of course, has major systemic consequences. Uh, and my point would be that I can see how this can be done relatively easily and quickly at firm level or at national level. After all, uh, it's a question of uh, risk repricing. Uh, and uh, we can uh, have a military equipment which is more resilient than ordinary equipment, uh, provided we pay for that. So if it's within a firm, this rebalancing would lead to a repricing of risk and to costs, which then will have to be somehow either absorbed by productivity or by profit or by the consumer. Rather easy in theoretical terms. The point I want to make uh, very briefly is that uh, this rebalancing, which is easy at the sort of firm or national level, will be much more difficult to do at global level. And the reason for that is that uh, leveling the playing field in efficiency is much easier than leveling the playing field in resilience. And the reason for that is very simple. Efficiency in a global market capitalism is ideologically flat. It's about profit maximization under some public constraints. Leveling the playing field in precaution is much more difficult because precaution is a much more heterogeneous domain. It is heavily influenced by ideology, by culture, by religion, simply because a risk is something in between a pole of good and a pole of bad. And a pole of good and a pole of bad are heavily dependent on mental representations. 
the anthropologists call cognitive differences, to use a bit of a technical word. This is going to be a big problem. And that's my answer to Sharon, uh, who was uh, teasing me uh, uh, a few hours ago on whether I would still uh, look uh, as much to fight against protectionism. Of course I would, because I think opening trade is the way to go under some conditions. The problem being that dealing with what I call precautionism will be much tougher than dealing with protectionism. Protecting producers from foreign competition is a cooking we understand, we know, we know the technicalities of this, we know the politics of that. Protecting people from risks in a different way will fragment the global trading system in a much more definitive uh, 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 fashion than tariffs. And I will, uh, and, and of course, as a consequence of that, the debalancing of the level playing field or the bigger difficulty to level it will harm small countries, small producers, and poorer people, even in uh, rich countries more. And I will take to conclude just one example with one proposal to sort of land this theoretical discussion uh, into, uh, into reality. We are talking a lot about medical stuff, medicines, drugs, medical equipment. If you want to increase human welfare, you have to decrease the price of medical stuff. If you look at the global system today, the problem with the price of medical stuff, optimizing efficiency and resilience in medical stuff is not tariffs. The problem, the trade problem with medical stuff is not tariff, it's non-tariff measures. And in this case, a perfectly understandable precaution, which translates into drugs marketing authorizations. It's absolutely logical that before I admit a drug in my market, I check that they are good for human health. The problem being that in this field, the procedures from different countries, the criteria, the certification, what you have to test, what you have to demonstrate, the sort of guarantees you have to work are totally different. If we want to reach more efficiencies and more resilience in this business, the solution is very simple. You have to level the playing field in terms of precaution, i.e. make sure that there is a minimum and if possible a maximum of convergence of harmonization of the way you do that. This leads to one of the questions that was raised. Can the present system do that? No. The WTO has no authority, nor does it have any expertise to say, look guys, we are going to harmonize marketing drugs authorization systems. It has to be done at another level, probably somewhere between WTO and WHO, a bit like what exists in the Codex Alimentarius between WHO and FAO. I'm taking this example because these systemic issues have to land somewhere. And this is one of the issues and proposals which I think we have to look in the direction. Thank you, Pascal. Um, true that the standardization and the change of the regimes that we have in terms of medicines uh, would need to be rethought completely. The question of the cost of this movement to make the systems more resilient um, uh, related to your argument of um, leveling the playing field, I think we, we really need to, to get into this debate because the fact is I feel the train has gone on that uh, direction. I feel that now the, 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 what we're hearing from policymakers is how do we shorten to supply chains, how we are less dependent from uh, foreign producers, and how do we uh, build up the buffers ourselves uh, away from the system of just in time and so, um, Laurence, how do we reconcile what Pascal is saying that we try to preserve the benefits of the whole construction that we have built from 
betrayed and uh, eliminating these tariffs. But at the same time, we know that the sentiment that the vulnerability that he has created is bringing policymakers to look inward, not outward. Um, thanks, Gabriela, and thanks, everybody. So I listened to most, also not all um, of it, but it was super interesting. And I think it, this conference really matches the questions that we're all trying to uh, to analyze at the OECD. And um, and, I, and Pascal really put a name on it, which is that resilience come, comes with a price, whereas I think we have a huge problem with the price discovery of, of the real value of some things. But anyway, um, I will try and focus on a, on a few points. The first thing is just to sum up what we knew uh, and in order to try and see how we can, and uh, sorry, what we knew, what got worse with the crisis and, and what's uh, really new and see how we can um, we can get from there. Um, because as you were saying, Gabriela, I, I, I think NAEC in particular and, and the OECD more generally, uh, as well as the people around the table, so to speak, have been warning about this um, situation many times. So I think we sort of knew that we were not prepared for risks which have a low probability but have huge implication. Uh, and that's true for the pandemic. It's also true for climate. And I think it's also true for cyber security. And as Dawn was highlighting energy. And, and also, I think uh, what, what became um, even more apparent was that we lacked flexibility in an agility in our response. We also knew that we had interconnected societies, um, both advanced and, and less advanced, and, uh, and the fact that the virus spreads through plane, as somebody reminded us at the beginning, is, is really highlighting that. Um, and then, as Pascal was mentioning, uh, we also knew that the global governance um, had become fragile. Um, now, what, what seems... Um, to be accentuated is, I think, something that really has to do with resilience and that Sharon was alluding to, which is the question of inequality between people. Um, and this crisis really point the finger at it, um, having you know spared those who can telework like us and the others who are on the front line. Um, what's more new, I think, is the anxiety about the security of our health system and the security of the supply chain. And we had them for discussion in the previous session uh, and about the stability of our economies and society, which also has to do with the inequalities I was mentioning. And also, I think we, we've put an infinite price on the value of life in this crisis, which is something that we were not uh, really mentioning as well or as clearly uh, before. And what, so that's, uh, that's roughly what we knew and what became a bit novel. Uh, and the question is, how do we answer this to ensure, and I think that's implicit in, um, in all the work of NIAC and INET, ensure economic and social resilience because one doesn't go without the others. Um, so you were asking, how do we do it? And which I think is the most difficult question for which we don't have a definite answer, but let me offer a few direction. Um, I think at the national level, we all have, you know, risks agency and they usually focus, they usually have to draw back. One is they tend to focus on one type of risks. And the other is that they tend to be within government and with little participation of other actors like firms, civil society was mentioned several times, um, and non-governmental organization. They, they tend to treat each risk in silo, and that's probably, and they probably don't pay enough attention towards interconnection. Um, and I also think that there is an issue of communication. Otherwise, people would put more pressure. So we don't hear them loud enough. But that's that's perhaps because of the institutional setup. And I'd be curious to know how much, how many of them are actually accountable to parliaments. 
The other thing is, um, now let me move. So, so the lesson I will take from this is it has to be across ministries and it has to involve a lot more participants of, of the society, whether it's the civil society, whether it's firms, whether it's NGO, and it has to be embedded in a process that gives democratic control over what they do in order to put pressure. And I think uh, there was a lot of discussion before that, you know, we, we needed to empower, people needed to be responsible and to, and to put pressure for these issues. And then you raise the issue of the global organization and, and governance. Um, and it's, I think, very striking that, that we don't have some sort of agency that covers all those risks, the natural risks, like uh, obviously the pandemic risk, but also the climate risk, also the cybersecurity risk, and all of those that actually are intertwined and, and have impact on each other. Um, and that for this sort of agency, um, and it can be a network of, of already existing institution, obviously, but they would need obviously funding, they would need the capacity to, you know, issue principles and standards like the OECD does. The OECD does, they, they would be in charge of coordinating the search and solution. Um, and, and I think one model, but which again is exclusively focused on one risk and financial, which is the financial risk is the financial stability board. Um, but really all the natural risks we have discussed and their interconnection with the real and financial economy make, make, should make them really a common concern for one uh, institutional or own group of institution. And by the way, I would just like to remind, as you know, all. I mean, as all of you know, actually, the Financial Stability Board was set up in the wake of the great financial crisis. So perhaps we have to think about something like that. And then I would like to make just a final point, being mindful of, of time. It's very, the, the discussion on, on supply chain and the lack of transparency was, was very striking to me. And there's an area we keep doing, if, if I use the analogy with the financial system, uh, like for the FSB, uh, you know, we have stress tests for bank, the banking sector. And in a way, we, we, and we also have stress tests for the insurance sector. Believe me, there's nothing more intransparent uh, than a solvency model or, or the model of assessing the risk of an insurer balance sheet. Uh, but yet we manage to do this. Uh, and I was wondering to what extent it would be feasible to actually ask firms, whether they're private or public, to, to consider stress testing their supply chain in, this, in the same spirit that we stress test banks balance sheet or insurer balance sheet. Um, and we could stress test them for the closing down of one country or another. I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that most businesses are doing it, but it's not being made public to any regulator. Uh, and that may be a, a road to have actually more insight on the supply chain and, and also understanding better where they go and where the risks are. Um, the last, very last point I would like to make is uh, we had a lot of discussion about uh, competition and resilience and how you know competition had led supply the, the production to be really dependent on one country or a couple of countries, depending on, on the supply chain. Um, there, there are two words from there. One is to shorten the supply chain and imagine that you can put everything back on, onto your territory. And we heard the congressman really thinking about this. Um, and there is another one, which is ensuring uh, diversification. And diversification re requires a level playing field in, in, in competition and resilience. But I, I think we should consider it much more than shortening the supply chain, because there's one element which, uh, which we haven't much discussed this afternoon, which is this you know, becoming more national and shortening the supply chain will raise tremendous issue for the south part of the world. And the last thing we want to do, I think, when we strengthen the resilience of our system is actually widened the divergence and the inequality between the North and the South. 
Um, so that's uh, a few points to try and contribute or sum up some of the points of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laurence, and, and we wish we had more time because you have really touched upon uh, very concrete institutional innovations that could be uh, brought to bear in terms of bringing this new thinking. Uh, Paul, we are uh, late. We will give you the floor for uh, your final remarks, and then I will um, conclude this panel and pass the word to Barry. Thank you so much for your, for your insights. Thank you very much. I'll be very quick. First of all, nice to see and speak with Laurence and, and Pascal who are good friends. Um, a few points very quickly, each of them. First of all, the way we've used efficiency this afternoon, this is the efficiency in the minds of businessmen and women, not efficiency in the minds of economists. The, the not coping for resilience is a market failure. And I think this matters in terms of both the debate and, and not walking into a roadblock when, um, the three speakers on this panel, our friends at the top universities weigh in and say we don't understand the, the concepts. But it's also important to recruit them to greater resilience. Inadequate resilience is market failure. This is not something to do with neoliberalism um, or views of, of social welfare um, um, functions. That's the first thing. Second thing I'd say is Laurence made, I think it's a great, really important point, a great point about the, the infinite price um, being put on life. And I think the reason for that is, for what it's worth, is that I think as citizens, we will tolerate a probability of dying from the flu or cancer even, God help us, um, if we think that our societies have done their best, given the, the, the currently available technology, to, to prepare for that particular kind of problem, make it available to, to, to everybody. Whereas, whereas this is something that no one has prepared for at all. And so if people have pursued herd immunity, as some gov governments may have, have, have contemplated for a while, what it's amounted to saying is we're not going to protect you, actually. Well, we're going to let you, we're going to let you die. Um, so I think, I think the reason I'm saying that is I think a lot of the literature particularly in, in law schools about the value of life and the cost-benefit world is, is pretty misconceived because it actually only works when you know the underlying stochastic process or have got an estimate of the underlying stochastic process. It doesn't, it's not helpful when you confront something which you don't understand. Now, that brings me to a point, it matters enormously how exposed we are to pandemic risk. I mean, the appropriate response depends rather like the banking crisis. It matters whether this is a one in 700 year event or actually whether we could have another one of these in five years time. And what's, what is specially different about this kind of crisis from the financial stability crisis in 0708 is that although the 0708 crisis was dreadful and although my world did, hadn't covered itself in glory, as it was happening, actually, we had the tools to understand it. Whereas the, the scientists and the medics involved with this, they don't understand this virus even now. And so it's very hard for them to give robust advice. Economists put uncertainty bands around things. The uncertainty bands for them, they tend, it seems that they don't talk very much on uncertainty, but the uncertainty bands for them must be enormous. I, I would make two more points and then stop. First of all, about stress testing. Um, I think this has been a fantastic development in the banking field, probably the most important development in the last 30 or 40 years, sadly, most of which I can remember. But don't underestimate the extent to which not only the industry has been trying to undermine it, which is definitely the case, but also it's being complained, oh, it's, 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 it's opaque for the rule of law, it needs to be much more formulaic. And so actually, it has become bureaucratized. Um, I mean, I, I was one of the high priests of, of, of stress testing in 2010-11, and I tell you, they're not doing it in the way that I would want them to do it, because they, are, because they need to justify their process as fair. And so the trade-offs we face aren't just between resilience and business efficiency. They're also, how do you ensure due process without bogging yourself down in, in, in a process that actually re removes the value? The final thing I would okay. say, is about international organizations and the international system where I basically agree with what others have said. But the key thing, Laurence mentioned the Financial Stability Board. 
the key and the financial stability board i think was terrific although everyone has to accept that i would say that um the key things about the financial stability board are a it was built on the financial stability forum and in truth although finance ministries were involved it was hosted by the bank for international settlements and at least initially driven by central banks who could not be closer to each other as a community and i think the big question in the in the health field is is and i wouldn't i wouldn't push it now if i were in office is is the who fit for being built into a different kind of organization or not and what other kinds of organization are needed in other fields and how does one how does one build one that's effective through a community that already exists Uh, it's very hard to build effective organizations. I would have more faith in an add-on to the OECD than something that came out of the came out of the blue as a new concept. Okay. We are going to finish with that fantastic statement, Paul. Just to say, I'm going to pass the floor now to Barry because we are over time. But I just want to say that this has been the best investment we have made to listen to you and also to bring all the speakers. What we take from here is that what we have been proposing in NAEC to go for systems thinking, to make sure that the efficiency argument is just one option, is not the only option because it has been presented by all the economic policy frameworks as the main option and following from that, all the other things, equity distribution or resilience will follow, but it's just one. And we need to understand that there are trade-offs and, and there are policy choices. And I think this is exactly what we have learned all the all day long. And I'm sure that uh, we, with the with the with collaboration with uh, with Barry, will continue discussing these options because we cannot have all the answers. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but these kind of of reflections will probably help us to be less vulnerable if the next uh, crisis uh, come. So Barry, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you so you. much to my speakers. Thank you, Gabriella. It's uh, been um, a truly excellent uh, collaboration with um, the entire Nike team and the OECD. And uh, I just want to thank a couple of people as we reach the end of the day. It's, you know, William Hines and uh, Julian Karaguzian were uh, just uh, worked fantastically hard on this and uh, were. Uh, Uh, it's, you know, a, we look forward very much to this continuing. I also wanted to uh, thank uh, a couple of the other folks, uh, Angela Stewart at the uh, OECD and also Nitty uh, Hegday and uh, and Kat Dill uh, with our team and, and actually the whole open markets team. Um, it's, uh, as you mentioned, this is the beginning of a, of a collaboration. It started last year at that fantastic conference that you guys uh, 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 held last September on averting systemic collapse, as you mentioned, as you noted, uh, the collapse came uh, perhaps a lot sooner than we expected. Um, but, uh, you know, the it's great when a conversation is already underway that helps you understand what happened and what to do about it. Uh, this is the beginning of a conversation. Uh, we, as a, the Open Markets, looks forward uh, very much to continuing this. And uh, we're, it's a great honor to be able to work with you all. And um, uh, I do want to, I believe that uh, sec the Secretary General uh, Guria is uh, available and I just wanted to uh, flip it back to him for uh, one last comment. Uh, thank you, Barry. Listen, um, uh, in any seminar in, in Davos, uh, you know, in any, um, it, the, the greatest thing, the greatest ambition is you don't have to be thinking what you're going to say in order to sound reasonably intelligent, <laughs> you just listen to the wisdom. You just sit there and choose which are the people you're going to hear, et cetera. And today was one of those days, you know. Uh, um, actually, Gabriela said, uh, would you like to participate? And I said, no, absolutely no way. Uh, I would just like to listen. And it has been so rewarding. Uh, as I said before, Uh, our, our duty, our motto is actually better policies for better lives. But how can we tell our member countries and our partner countries, which now add to more than 100, um, not, not just uh, the 36 members, now about 38, by the way, we're growing. But, but uh, how, how do we tell them what it is that they have to do 
if we ourselves are not uh, aware, at least, of the cutting edge of what's going on um, and uh, uh, what what are the ideas, what are the new the new things that are going on? You you provide us with that. You know, you give us that oomph. You know that you give us that push, uh, and you also give us that ambition. You give us a vision, uh, and 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 then our mission becomes. Uh, if not easier, because it's never easy, but at least it becomes clearer. We have a greater sense of purpose. So you you provide all that. That's invaluable. And I'd just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, it's been terrific working with you guys, and um, it's a fantastic organization. And uh, uh, I want to, you know, it's terrific that the folks um, 70 years ago, created organizations that we can use today. And uh, it's important to have institutions. And OECD is uh, one of the foundations of this world and will continue to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. To the next one.